Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this will deal with the pedestrian issues, uh, uh, primarily uh, you know, food safety along that stretch. And three, what I mentioned um, this motion is that we place a sign appropriately around Souls Road uh, and Archway there to direct, it, like right by the old, there's an overpass there that um, that takes you over to Division Road, Division Health. Yeah. I have a sign placed there to encourage vehicles to use Highway 11 instead of Archway. Um, hopefully that'll reduce some of the volume. So that's that's the motion I'm putting forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Cox. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Oh, <clears throat> Adam CAO. Thank you. I wondered if the member would con uh, consider a friendly amendment that staff be directed to report back on those issues, because typically in the issues of speed, we would do a study and then we would come back with council with what the results are. We, we don't typically decide on the fly. And I'm, I'm not sure if the multi-use path would be the same same concern. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I would be, be fine with that. I know there was a study done as uh, part of the transportation study, but uh, and that's noted in at least one of those pieces of correspondence. But sure, the staff will report back on that. Um, on the motion, um, I can live with that. And it's just, I, I do hope there's some urgency associated with this since the safety issue exists now and does involve school children and other matters. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Plunkett, and then Member Mr. Cox, and then Member Mays. I'm just going to say, Mr. Chair, I have to have a motion. Okay, let's. Uh, you want, well, let's hear it from the members and then we'll hear it from Member Fox and Member Mays. I just wanted to agree with uh, Member Brennan on this one. And the other one is I, I do know that we will have a report come back, but I think this one should be um, expedient because this is an issue on that road. And when <clears throat> that playground opens up, that uh, we, will, we may have more traffic. And so I would really appreciate the fact that the studies as Member Brennan has said, we're in the transportation master plan about the speed, and I don't think that that street has any uh, speed marked on it right now. So it would be quite easy to understand that with the new um, development in that area, that it would be a safety community issue. And I also totally agree with the sign. So that will indicate to people head out to Highway 11 North, then go to Minoki, and then go into the where the new uh, rec center could be, but the playground now is. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Member Mays. <clears throat> thank you through the chair, and, um, <clears throat> perhaps to the CAO. I, I agree with um, what's being proposed here. However, as in my preparation for the discussion on the transportation master plan, there are other roads that have identical concerns, also where we don't have citizen emails. Uh, our correspondence that has come in on that. So I think it's a broader conversation. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, on Archeria Road, it shows on the transportation master plan that it's an arterial road. And that, to, that by definition, because I have to look it up, uh, means that it's a through street and it connects um, some areas, so um, I would agree with having a staff report to see what's appropriate because there may be other um, traffic measures that can be put into place. Thank you. Okay, Member Brennan yeah. and then Member Fox. Yeah, um, uh, yeah that's what, that's what that's There may be lots of issues we've watched through, and I, I have a distinct feeling that getting to this transportation plan is going to take more than one meeting. Um, but I'd like to see this action. Uh, as an individual item as opposed to whatever package of things we might discuss over the next month or well, we're going to have July off, so that would be August, September. Certainly would like this result for the school year uh, as a minimum. The other thing that I, I wanted to mention, the heavy trucks issue, uh, I didn't include the provision of excluding heavy trucks. Our children are not, we can change that. But what I would respect, I would, what I would hope is that the developer in the area would be urged to encourage truckers to operate safely, much like we deal with in terms of our dealings with Nelson aggregate. And should they not uh, be more cautious around uh, pedestrian traffic there, that in fact, at some time in the future, I'll put forward a motion to stop any trucks on that section. So, 
Thank you. Uh, Member Fox. <clears throat> I agree with what uh, Member Brennan said, and, I, and I'm, I realize that there are other issues, but right now we have this major issue here. And uh, I think we should do this motion and deal with it because we have had the citizens in, and then when we come to the other issues, they will be noted. Thank you. Okay, so let's put the motion again there, Mr. Fox. Can Mr. Chair, uh, the motion is this, that staff be directed to review the appropriate speed limit on Artria Drive and report back. That's the question that never comes. We also wanted a multi-use path and a sign. Mm -hmm. I remember for Kat. Thank you. Thank you through the chair to Derek. Do we, there's no signage just the speed limit on Artria Drive. Is it 80 kilometers an hour? Is, is that what I can understand? Uh, thank you, through the chair. The um, yeah, so when an unposted uh, roadway in Ontario follows the Highway Traffic Act, and it's about whether it's built up or not. So because of the lack of residential homes and the type of roadway it functions, like you said, it's, a, it's actually a collective roadway. Um, so it would be de facto. Okay, so that's just a good sign. Okay, Andrew, have you added the? Um, the amended sign to the motion. Well, I can, Mr. Chair, that staff be directed to review the appropriate speed limit on Artria Drive, post a sign, and uh, report back on the use of or the installation of a multi use path. Okay, that's moved by Member Brennan, second by Member Hart. No, it's not quite. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he yeah. said sign, but it's just it's just not right. it's not right in, in the right context. I think yeah. it's the review, the, review the signage. Okay. Review the signage. So that was because it's not necessarily still signage; it's directional signage. Okay. Member Jansen, all in favor? The blue ones. That's carried. Thank you. So now we'll we'll get into the. Uh, Transmission master plan and through to Derek there. I think our procedure, and I think all members would, would like to input, take our time, and if this takes, as Member Brennan said, today, and then maybe we can uh, uh, work today till lunchtime and then see where we're at, and then we're going to be meeting in August or September or both, and then go from there. But I think we should treat this uh, uh, page by page, and we got questions all the way through, and some people have sent questions through. I know Member Minning says some. Questions. I think they're, they're common questions and we can get them all answered together. But that's just uh, my thoughts. And uh, Member Burkett, if you had your comments. Thank you, through the chair. I just wanted to first thank Derek. Derek, it's nothing personal. This is a working, we're all in council. This is a working document. It's a document that we all are engaged in and we have concerns. And because we all love our community, this is why we're here today. And so I know that you won't take it personal because it's going to be good discussion for all of us. And as the chair has said, if we, we don't finish today, you know, it took two and a half years, I think, Derek, to, to get this to us. And so if it, if it takes another meeting to council, that's fine, right? It's a working document. But I want to remind council that, yes, we're all going to fight for each of our boards, but the document is for the township of Severn. So it, it's for, for the whole township. So I just want to remind everyone when we're making those decision, decisions, it's what's the what is the best for all of our residents, even though we have concerns in each one of our awards. Thank you, Karen. Yes. <laughs> so, so then I go back. You're going to share the screen there, and, and Derek, and we'll go through uh, the preamble first, and then we can jump in uh, into the uh, report. Uh, Member Cox. Through the chair, I, I'm not sure how when you said go page by page because if we get to the executive summary, there'll probably be a lot of questions that will pop out of that and we'll have to refer to other sections. Is that all right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, because I just thought that that executive summary mm -hmm. contains a lot of, of issues and charts and things, and as questions come up, we, we could refer to other ones if that's all right with staff and the rest of council. And or do we just want to do you want to skip? I got it. I'd just like to know how you want to work this through the chair to director of public works. Thank you, and yes, uh, through the chair. So I think I'll start just by introducing um, you know what this document really does. 
and we'll pull it up on the screen and, and I'll have the track changes on as well because staff did make some amendments from the previous discussion uh, following council motion uh, during the first receipt of the draft here. So we'll go through that and then we can go page by page and then I'll let the chair obviously dr uh, drive the conversation at that point. But so first I want to thank, you know, the committee uh, for this special report for services. Uh, this is an important document, uh, both for staff and for the township. It sets, you know, a growth pattern and, and identifies, you know, existing issues in our transportation system. It also anticipates future concern, you know, in our transportation network. And, uh, and the, the sole purpose of this document is to be completely visionary. Um, we are setting out a number of projects, very specific looking projects. However, I just want to remind that, you know, the public consultation portion of any of these projects is not over, you know, with the, with the delivery of this report. We do follow the municipal class environmental assessment process, which is a mandatory requirement for all public projects from the province of Ontario. And in that, there is a number of streams, what they call schedules, but most of the projects listed here, specifically the projects that have, um, I would say, a unique quality of social disruption, uh, somewhat of being a bit of a hot potato. <laughs> and so those projects uh, require additional work for public consultation, review of alternatives, uh, evaluations of the cost of the work, both fiscally and to the environment and to the people that live in those areas. So, so that is the purpose of this report. Um, we did have a previous rendition of the first, and it was in 2014. Um, you'll see that a number of the projects, you know, maybe just are no longer relevant or supported by council, and that's quite okay. These are living documents. And they, they do uh, look for an update once every five years. Typically, we work quite a bit, you know, almost 10 years for the last round. And, uh, and it does set up a 20 year growth pattern to match um, a planning target that we see in the official plan, in other uh, relevant master plans, as well as the, the provincial growth plan, the Greater Golden Horseshoe Plan, and the County MCR. So, all of these documents talk to each other and they look to the same planning horizon. So hopefully I've established you know, what this document really does and, and what its goal is. And, it, and once again, the conversations per project are not over. It just gives an idea of what are the transportation related challenges we see here in summer. Member Cox. <clears throat> through the chair to, to Derek. Derek, just to clarify, when you're saying that the plan is uh, five to 10 years, but we, we look at the 20 year growth. So that means that um, it's just to help us figure out, because you sort of delve into that a little bit more, because you had said <clears throat> the visionary compared to the five year plan, I'm sorry. If I may, through the chair. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Madam CEO. Um, I think what the director meant is we're supposed to review it every five years, but it is meant to be a 20 year planning horizon, similar to the official plan. The official plan goes to 2041, so this is to mirror that to go to 2041. But we would review it every five years. It's not that it's meant to be a five year document. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that whole visionary, and then actually, it's a, we look at it every five to 10 years in between, and then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Burke. <clears throat> Thank you through the chair. So there if we go to uh, page I just I just wanted to speak to the alternative three. Is that the one that we like as part of because this is a visionary uh, document. Page three or two. It says alternative three road network strategy. You got short term, medium term, long term. Before we go to the final page, like you, I don't know where the chair wants to go. I just wanted to speak. Yeah, start on page one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. But I thought. Uh, I don't know who's okay. I'll wait till we get to page two. Sorry. Okay, Derek, if you want to uh, show us where you want to start, we can get our. Thank you, through the chair. Um, yeah. So th this is the document I'm sharing here. So I thought 
maybe we could go a little bit page per page, especially at the executive at the executive summary level. And uh, just through the chair uh, to the mayor's question, um, the preferred strategy was a list of four, I think, alternatives um, that you do in any type of, of um, planning document like this. You would try to review, you know, what could be our alternative. So alternative one is to do nothing. You know, you, you could just effectively carry on with the existing network, uh, replace existing assets as they are, and, and effectively not plan for future growth or address challenges within the transportation network. So, you know, that is an alternative. It's, it's not usually recommended because that doesn't solve any of the transportation related problems that we see here in Severn or plan for growth for that matter. And then there's other alternatives. And where we landed in the alternatives list, and uh, I can just go to the next page, which does have the alternative we landed on, is alternative three, which is a, a road network strategy where we do look to invest in transportation connections and looking for all the transportation investments and coordinating growth with the existing transportation network. But it's not alternative four, where we look at a truly multimodal transportation network, a very costly venture, to be honest, uh, where we start to implement transit and you know other um, types of movement, goods movement, things like that, that uh, you know would be certainly a great benefit, but it probably exceeds you know the vision for Severn in terms of both cost, project quantity, and uh, scope. So that's kind of where we landed. Is number three out of four. Um, Thank you through the chair. Thanks, sir. Um, alternative three, <laughs> because previous to this paragraph, there isn't an alternative one. Or where is that? Can you show me? Certainly, and through the chair, this look, that'll get a little bouncy, just because in the document it's further down. Um, if we went through the day, I can promise you there's a page that has all four alternatives laid out and a chart that lists what the impact of each alternative might have. Okay, uh, Member Mennington and your Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Burkett. Thank you, through the chair. So, my concern with all alternative three is the wording where it says, and improve routes for aggregate production. So I'm looking to other members of the council and how they feel about, and I know that they stated in this document that the aggregate companies are an economic driver for our township. Well, I, I beg to differ. I believe that sitting in this chair, aggregate companies, yes, they do employ some people. But what they do is oodles of money and all kinds of grief from our residents. Like, I'd like to take that out of there. You know, and in the future, and I know there's another, there's a couple of aggregate companies that have bought lands in, in our township, and if they want to extract the aggregate, and for a better lot, well, I can't say that word, as they rape and pillage our town, they're the ones that are benefiting, not us. It's not we that are benefiting from that. We, yes, get cents per ton uh, every year, and I think last year we got close to 700000 which is great, but all that money gets spent to repair what they and how they destroy our roads. So we're spending $2 million this year on Burnside. So I would like to take that out of there, but I'm not sure how the other members of council feel. Second, uh, Member Mannings. Thank you through the chair and the <coughs> council member for chat. I agree, and those are many of my notes throughout this document um, to remove the references to haulage routes and spending our our taxpayers' dollars on ensuring that that company or that sector of the business is um, is accommodated to their doorstep from and along the highway. So um, I think that uh, that's where I've removed references to haul rent uh, from the document. It's not part of our um, 20 or 5 years spending. I know we should. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Brennan, and Member Cox, and Member Jansen. Uh, yes, uh, I can't imagine a plan that doesn't include a reference to haul routes. I mean, we have the 
We're the sixth largest aggregate producer in the farm for the wet and And the legislation strongly favors aggregate production in Ontario, particularly since the government came here. <clears throat> so I would be concerned with the absence of proposals that are going to, you know, protect in the environment that uh, Mayor Burkett is talking about, and I don't disagree with their conclusions. I think they're costing us money. Um, but we can't just not have, I mean, it's unimaginable, you know, like, you just need to turn to Burnside there in division for two minutes and tell me that that, you know, we're not going to, we're going to ignore them. Good luck with that. If we do, our plan would be deficient. What I can see us doing perhaps as an alternative is suggesting that if there are going to, and, and there will be gravel expansions, we know that from our other plan. If that's going to happen, that the costs of maintenance and development need to be paid for by the aggregate firms. And they need to go through a planning process like any other Class EA process that balances the interests of A, our environment, and B, our residents. So that's why I would suggest that the two important leave out, but let's put the in the back. We're not making these roads, we're not spending this money. You're making the money. You pay for the roads. You maintain the roads to our fire standards. I would, if you're somebody to work that way, I think it would be more appropriate. Thank you, Member Cox. Thank you, Member Jansen. Okay, I, I understand when it says improve all routes for agri projection. Maybe if we just take out improve and just say local travel improvements and haul routes for aggregate, because I do agree that haul routes are important, but I would also ask. The director of public works to explain how each uh, tone comes out and the money that's supposed to come to us to help improve roads. And if there's anything we can do, it would be to go to the aggregate. There is an aggregate, whatever it's called, uh, community that we actually the mayor and I have been to their meeting, and and we need to say maybe they need to be paying more for tone to help us improve our roads. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Gary. Could speak to that, and then Member Jansen. Yes, certainly. Thank you to the chair. Um, so we are actually part of a, a group called the Top, on, Top Ontario Municipal uh, Aggregate Production. The TAPMO is the uh, is the acronym, mm -hmm. and that's because we are six, if not climbing to fourth largest aggregate exporter in the province. And with that, we do have a seat at the table where that that uh, group actually lobbied for a transfer of more cents per tonne. Uh, to the municipalities that are housing these aggregate extraction operations, which ultimately ends up in dollars in, in the tax um, levy or in the reserves rather, uh, for the improvement and maintain, maintaining of those aggregate home rates. So, so we are part of that. There is a group that lobbies for those, um, for those dollars. And, uh, and right now we are investing in Burnside line using those dollars. Uh, very specifically from that reserve account. So there's an example where you know the the framework of aggregate extraction in Ontario does try to balance out the impact to the local um, area they extract from. So, yeah. so supplemental to that. So I, I would want the improvement. I mean, I know we have that ball roots, but I, I don't know that we need to improve it until we find out what we need to improve. And, and I just think it's a wording, a wording thing. But I do realize that in the future, um, there needs, right now, they need to just go on our home routes. And that, that the biggest problem is, as we all know, is they don't follow our home routes. It's not the fact that we don't have them and we told them to go on them. So it's the policing of it. And unfortunately, it's not a police issue. It's, it's policing to keep them where they're supposed to be so they don't ruin our other roads that are not covered under the tone. And we have to take out our residents' content. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Jansen, and then Member Brennan, and then Member Burkett. Thank you, and to the chair, I just wanted to make a comment that I, I do believe we, we we need to have discussions about um, our all routes. Um, I, I think it should be in there. Um, for me, it's not just about improving the all routes for for the producers, but it's also for the residents that live along those all routes uh, to ensure that uh, um, it's safe. Um, uh, I know for myself, uh, going around the community uh, during the campaign, uh, on the hall roofs, uh, there there are complaints that are coming forward. Um, so I think it is important to be discussed about how we can make improvements, as well as uh, making sure that, uh, as, as Ms. 
member Cox said, that um, uh, they're using the routes properly. Um, I am glad to see that the Thorburn Hall route was taken out, um, as was discussed at the last uh, corporate services. Thank you. Thank you, the member Brennan and then member of the yeah, I just wanted to note also that in terms of traffic volumes, the main, it was a, a consent item in our recent meeting that we had with regard to a posting of proposed changes to the Aggregate Resources Act 244.97 that expired in about two weeks on streamlining approvals for aggregate resources and supporting policy. I'm hoping tomorrow Arturo will be asked about this, but one of the five major changes that will come about under that already. Enabling recyclable aggregate material to be imported that includes concrete, asphalt, bricks, glass, and ceramics to aggregate sectors. We now are talking about two way traffic streams to the load of truck, not just one. And I have no doubt this is going to go through. Our world is going to change right in the middle of the planet. Thank you. Have any comment? Yeah, Jerry, put that. Uh, Madam CEO. Sorry, I just wanted to wrap up so that Derek and I are clear <laughs> on what we heard. I think what I heard is haul routes are still important because not only do the trucks drive on them, but our residents drive on them, and we're such a big producer, we can't not mention them. That wouldn't be good planning, but we need to soften the language a little bit to talk about maintaining them rather than improving, improving safety and safety. Is that what I heard? Sorry. Thank you, I Member Burkett. Thank you, for the Chair. So, Member Brennan, I was on our agenda last last agenda with the class, and I didn't bring it up with, uh, with Derek. It was not on okay. there because I had concerns, and it is all recyclable material that came from, from sand. So, I guess they're going to compact it and then take it back. Is that not correct? Is that what they were doing with it, Derek? So through the chair, while I'm definitely not the expert in this, I mean, there is a growing um, challenge with waste and specifically waste that comes from natural products. So concrete um, and silica base, sands, hammocks. And uh, on top of that, soil, excess soil from construction sites has been also a challenge and not just, you know, uh, manufactured products, but excess soils. <coughs> and those are also destined for soil and class one like soil um, uh, production sites. And so there's another you know, potential source of traffic in the excess soil um, aftermarket. Thank you, Member Friends. <laughs> and there are many communities dealing with that excess soil issue right now. And a lot of that material is toxic. And what's recyclable is defined. So things can be fine as recyclable and be pretty nasty. And that's something that a community like ours has to keep in mind, right? It's like, you know, you can change the definition of affordable homes and make it go away, but you still need affordable homes. So it's that kind of thing. We have to be very, tomorrow I hope to ask some questions as to what is planned by NASA, whether they can share that or not, with the material that if they're asking for this, Clear the plan. Mm -hmm. Now, Member Cap. thank you through the chair supplementary, if I may. So, I just want to speak a little more to this egg. And I know that the uh, council is okay, but I don't want to create any new rows. The proposed quarries that are now slotted that have bought lands in this township, the one is up beside Walker's and one is beside Nelson's. I just don't want to create any new hall rooms. The hall rooms that exist today are the hall rooms that they need to use. For us to have east westerly or even contemplate the thought of building new haul routes for these these companies is something i won't entertain but to use the existing ones and and maybe take the improvement part out of it but consider the fact that yes we are aggregate rich and yes we have to consider <laughs> that they are here and i understand that but i just don't want to create any new new roads for them when they can use the existing ones that are here now Thank you, Member Coxon and Member Mins. So maybe we could just have in there something to the effect of the safety on existing improvement in the city. Ex this existing wall route, do you utilize that statement? Does that sound okay? And through the chair, we can change that phrase yeah, and make the word improve to maintain hall routes. 
uh, safe haul routes for aggregate production. And, and maybe go in and just get them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Member Bennings. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to lose track. Sorry, thank you, Dr. the Chair. Um, I agree the word improve is um should not be in there. But what what I believe is missing from that alternative is um I don't know the right word, maybe the policing of uh tr of uh aggregate trucks and heavy trucks to use the routes that are um for that because um and again I know at the outset the general comment was we're speaking to the whole of Sever and I absolutely believe that, but I only know my ward um, in a in a deeper <laughs> level. So, uh, for example, uh, roads like Grayshot and Turnbull have turned into haul routes, and um, uh, so I know South Sparrow Lake Road. Uh, when I was visiting somebody, uh, several aggregate trucks went speeding through the bends by the lake there. So we um, also need to not only um, allow trucks to use the haul routes that have been designated as such, but we also need to protect the safety of residents who find that these trucks are going through um, non-haul route streets. Thank you, but Madam CEO. Thank you, I 100% agree with those sentiments. The challenge is you can't fit it into a transportation master plan, it's an enforcement thing. So where you deal with that is when you have your quarterly meetings with the inspector and you make it clear that enforcement is your priority, um, but they're, they're separate things and it's difficult to fit into a, a master plan, but we, we, we hear your concerns and uh, we, we get them regularly. It's just in a, handled in a different way. Thank you. I'm going to let Member McIntyre speak and then Member Jansen and then Member Burkett. Thank you, through the Chair. Just before we leave this section, I'm just a bit mystified as to are we handcuffed on the price of this per ton from these aggregates? Is there any way we can, if we're spending $2 million and we're collecting $700,000, as Member Burkett said, something's out of balance there, out of, out of whack. Why are they not paying? <clears throat> I'll let Madam CEO jump in on that one. I'll okay. take that. It's provincial regulation. And if you'll remember, build more homes faster and more homes requires aggregate. So we can lobby the problems all you like on that, but you're probably not going to have success. So we don't have We right. don't set the, the rate here. It's set provincially. And we can't override any of We cannot. <laughs> we can't yes. Thanks for that. Anything else there, Member McIntyre? No, uh, that right there. Thank you. Member Jansen. Thank you. And through the chair, um, uh, in regarding uh, Member Paquette's uh, comments about um, not expanding any of the hull routes on Map 34, um, it does show that uh, the bedrock aggregate resources uh, go all the way from the community of Coldwater uh, straight across our uh, township to Mushango. How realistic is it that uh, uh, this land uh, will not be bought up by? Uh, aggregate companies, and we will have all routes down each one of these lines. Uh, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, thank you to the chair. Um, so that's that's a bit of a tough question to answer because the the pause exists, right? Our mapping and from the glacier um, movements and, and what's there is is certainly a, a naturally rich um, aggregate resource. But I wouldn't be able to tell you if there's, you know, any real pending applications. There's really only a few that are kind of in the Nelsons, uh, which is actually uh, what they call Utah, um, in that in that geographic area where there's probably pretty right potential. But um, Burnside Line certainly currently serves that with North South Route, and uh, and so yeah, it's hard to say what would be in that band heading towards cold water and up through Shago where it converts to a bit more of a, a sandy uh, approach. Thank you. Member for Cat. Thank you. Just to uh, three <coughs> words here to Member Jansen. So, the map that you've shown, just for the benefit of Council, the area um, south of uh, Burnside, there's too much overburden. They knew the farmers that, uh, so they opted out in buying. So, the section that they bought is actually Carly on over to Hampshire Mills. So they bought, uh, and then the Division Road, so they bought 1,200 acres, I think, in that area. So that will be slated for aggregate. And then over by Walkers, there's a chunk as well 
that uh, another aggregate company has bought, but those are the only two that I know of. That's why I said I didn't use the existing autos, but I wanted to speak to member Minning's comments about uh, trucks traveling on South Sparrow Lake Road or in the other two lines. Walker's Quarry are great custodians of our roads. If you can get a truck name or number, they will not load that truck. They will scold them when they get to the scales. And all you need to know is to get a, a name and then phone, phone the quarry and they will stop them. And Nelson's will do the same thing. They're not going to get all of them, but they have their own enforcement and they're very, they're very strict. Like I hear nothing from, from Walker whenever there's a concern. But as far as the trucks that are headed to the Turnbull subdivision, as soon as that subdivision is finished, it's unfortunate that they've had to use that road to provide sand and whatever for the development. But once that stops, you won't see any more of those trucks traveling those roads. Just on, it's an inconvenience at this point. Okay, uh, just a comment from mine. I, I was just a couple of weeks ago driving south on Wayman. They just paid, and I, two belly gravel trucks full were coming along Thorburn, and swinging right onto Wayman. Like, what's going? We just need the road, and they're abusing it. So I'm hoping we can discuss this. With Nelson, is that it's uh, yep. they told the mayor about it. I was so upset about it. We just paved the road, and where these trucks shouldn't be on, on it's not a hallway. So it hit his homework. And six or seven hundred thousand doesn't cover our expenses. It was two million for Burnside, and what did we spend on on Layman? Just a personal comment. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll let you continue there. Okay, so um, as we move along. Uh, you'll see here I got the document up and, and actually physically making some of the changes. This will help um, streamline the, the next report and the amended report to, to get there. And so you'll see that we crossed out improve and we said maintain existing. To try to separate that, we think that there's uh, uh, you know no new aggregate algorithms at this time plan. So going through this has been still the executive summary. Um, the next page talks about you know the terms. Um, so we got short term, medium term, and long term, and kind of separated by five year blocks, um, the last of the ten year block, and that just gives a bit of an indication of priority um, where we felt the community expressed more concern, got more priority, and and vice versa where. You know they were um, codependent on growth or things like that then they were in longer terms because we don't have a definitive forecast you know for those improvements so that's how we come up with those um, i'll just kind of go page by page and just let the chair drive uh, the conversation so. <clears throat> i remember the cox said the question yeah so what, if you go further down the road network implementation plan and it talks about intending to improve improve access to existing there we go i have questions on the private road standardization and um the proposed new westerly hall route um it doesn't say thorburn but it says for heavy truck traffic to access potential highway network without traveling to seven um in my mind i thought we took that out but I don't know if this is where we want to talk about the private road standardization and why we're doing it, or you want to wait till we get into that section. This is where I'm having a trouble with the summary compared to going through it by sections. So through the chair, that's exactly right. It is a summary, so it's going to hit all of the parts of the I know, plan. Yeah, I'm one. just saying we go to council though. Do you do you want to go through this and pull out, or do we want to just go through it and then go to the sections and pull out? Instead of dancing all over. Um, I would like to see as we come across things that we could deal with them just like we did with the previous item around hall roots, and then we can reference further into the document where we've taken notes and want to bring things forward. But um, because we're doing a page by page, I'm a little bit more comfortable just um, having that discussion. As yeah, supplemental, yeah, supplemental. So then I'll ask the private road standardization through local area improvements. Um, I realize that they are um, our road access plans, and we're talking about making them up to standard. I'm not sure why, and I don't know who's going to pay because we have other private roads, and we asked them 
They want us to take them over. We tell them it's their responsibility to bring them up to standards. So that was a concern I have because of all the private roads we have. And I know they're all not um, existing road allowances or dead end road allowances, but I'm afraid we put this in here. We've opened up a great big can of worms. I'll let Derek speak to that and then uh, Member McCaffrey. Uh, thank you to the chairman. I just opened up the one that made um, the changes from the last rendition over. So you'll see here that we have removed, um, you know, a, a couple of things like the new road connections. Um, removed the idea that it was, you know, a recommendation to go to Thorburn just simply to identify that there is a westerly, easterly poverty issue. Um, we can certainly take that out more. We'll take the rest of the council. Um, but regarding the section of what I call um, jurisdictional changes. Jurisdictional changes are things like where there's a private road that would be on the municipal road because there's an existing private road on the municipal property and that it's currently substandard and might serve a number of, of residents. And so those are under a local area improvement where the, the community itself would pay, like any benefiting property owners would pay directly for all the costs of upgrading roads like that. And if there wasn't a sufficient acceptance of those of those funds or those requests for funds, um, then the project wouldn't proceed. And so we did add some language further down in the report that very clearly established that it would be this report and council's position that any upgrades to a private road on a municipal road allowance will be funded by the benefiting property owners only. Remember, remember <coughs> Sorry, supplemental back to Derek. Then why put it in and say that? Why don't you just say, um, leave it? And then if somebody comes to us and asks if they want to improve, we tell them how to do it. Because I think this, this whole point, no offense, I think it opens it up and I don't think people will understand that. You know as well as I do, someone's going to say, oh look, we can have our road fixed. And there's six of us. So thanks. Th thank you through the chair. So the purpose of the plan is to identify transportation related concerns existing and forecasted in Severn. So uh, we certainly do know that a number of these private roads on municipal properties um, generate concern both operationally. They're often called trivial maintenance roads. So we do have a trivial maintenance policy. Um, but we get often way more calls than is permitted by the policy for maintenance because there is, you know, 30 or 40 uh, homes living on these roads and they, they are unable to really self-fund the road operation. Um, it usually takes some volunteers and things like that to snow plow and then that person may get sick or, or just give off the service and then they are out without, um, you know, winter control activities. So there's certainly a, a, a real problem with that approach and that's what this plan is to identify. Okay, I, I, I'll let them get to Thank you through the chair. So I have concerns with this, but why can't we add to it? Because my issue, Derek, is someone reading this, they're not going to go back to the end and read the summary where you say it, the onus is on the land, the benefiting landowners to pay for any upgrades to that road. Why couldn't we put that right in there in the wording rather than have it at the summary at the end? So that someone reading this we'll look at it and say, oh, we can get our road done. Oh, but we are going to have to pay for it ourselves. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Thank you, through the Chair. So we certainly heard that in the last conversation, the first delivery of this report. And I'll just bring your attention to the screen there where um, staff have under section 741, where we talked about jurisdictional changes and. The first one, of course, is actually just from municipal government to upper tier municipal government, but the rest are, are private roads um, existing on our current uh, own municipal road allowances. This is the additional language that you'll see in, in your agenda package, where we state that it is a recommendation of this plan that jurisdictional changes be proposed to the existing community that it would benefit, and that projects only advance if 50% of the benefiting property owners agree to a local improvement charge. And that any associated cost to acquire land, let's say, or improve the roadways would be funded by the benefiting property owner. So that statement was to bolster the words that were used in the original uh, draft of this plan that said local area improvement. Remember, Manningson, and I have a question on that page. Go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. 
I, um, what you've got here in 7.4.1 does not reflect the bullet that's in the, um, in the summary section. And I think, well, I know personally from reading through this document and trying to understand it, that what I've written through my hard copy are constant references back and forth. And it's, it's unclear if someone <coughs> reads this bullet here and proceeds with it, that they may not actually read the whole document and find the, the details and the requirements under 7.4.1. So we either need more cross-references because we've already experienced that in less than an hour that we're cross-referencing tables and maps and other sections. It's not user-friendly and for council, we are going back and forth already. So I think it's in there. I would just like to yeah. thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, Derek. So through the chair, um, that that's a really good comment. I mean, the executive summary, any executive summaries are to try to capture in less words the intent of the, the doc. And so if we're missing a portion of the overall intent, uh, in the executive summary, then you know we can certainly add that. So I just even just while we were doing that, I added you know a bold through the local <laughs> area improvement that was existing. So it, the existing words definitely relate that it would be a self-funded process. But then I added like why not? We'll add the statement in the executive summary. It's a little bit more words for the executive summary, but it is abundantly clear. Thank you. And also, <clears throat> you could add the section. Um, and because in the interest of of the, the length of the report, uh, uh, even, um, you know, the words or summary of the words, if I knew that section 4.741, then I would go to that and there I could read the full description. Um, because otherwise, we, we're not directing um, the users to the full intent of this. So I do appreciate that, but you may not want to just cut and paste it. Yes, absolutely. thank you, that's what I yeah, Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> and through the chair, just, and then one more item about that. We can certainly do a bit more cross-referencing. It's very good for a report to do that. Um, the table of contents gives, you know, at least a location and a link actually looks handy um, to the areas for that. So we'll, we'll try to do our best for the day here to add cross-referencing to clean up or tie together the document, but it is to be read in full. Um, the document doesn't operate on a page-by-page -page space for sure. <coughs> but Eric, you and I both know it depends to look at this. They're going to go to the executive summary. And then, you're just, so if we do this, this just helps us all because we know we had to read it all, but your average person is going to just go to the executive summary. So if we can do this and save you calls and everyone else what's going on, then this is the way to do it. Thank you very much. So Derek, back on that page with the uh, Carter Bros, there's five of them there, but Twin Oaks Crescent is a unique one where it has a reserve fund. I think it's like 600,000, and yet you're the budget is on like 1.4 million. And I'm just saying, what get the residents, right now the road's a disaster, and it was built on the premise, I think, of sometime coming back to the township, back in the former township of Kay. So when can that, those funds be ever used if we're looking at charging forty owners, you know, several twenty to thirty thousand dollars to get the road improved? And can we just put a gravel road in uh, that's suitable so it can be snow plowed and meet township uh, levels there? So through the chair, um, yeah, I mean, that that's a really interesting area um, in Twin Oaks where it highlights exactly what the jurisdictional change section 741 is all about. You know, we have a number of residents, full-time residents living on what is effectively a private road on a municipal road allowance, and they're not getting any service. You know, that they're not able to, you know, there was a, a gentleman, I believe, who needs some snowplow and some maintenance travel on the roadway but they've given that up and no one in the community has taken that step. Um, you know, there might be a private road association, which is more conventional to a cottage road and things like that, that are roads on private property, but this is a bit of a different scenario. So I think the answer to your question there is, you know, we can certainly accelerate that, but the additional funds would come from a local area improvement and we would need 50% support of the benefiting property owners to raise those funds and impose them on taxation and, uh, and create a project out of it. 
But my question is, like, how how far are you, are you calling it a, a, a paved road and sidewalks for that one point per million, or can we just have it upgraded to township standards, a gravel road? So through the chair, um, just so back to what we do as a as a road. Um, generally speaking, engineering design standards reflect what your standards are for road cross sections. We do have the option to go to gravel roads in very minimal circumstances. It has to be less than 200 cars a day or 150 cars a day, a very low volume area. Um, this would be considered for that, given that, but it's, it's not within your engineering design standards. So we'd have to accept a lower standard, but council could do that. And, uh, and then we would at least upgrade the width and the geometry and the overall access and the drainage is really the part that's missing today. Thank you. And this is going to show up on a chart later on in the report. So thank you. I'll let you carry on. <coughs> sure. Oh, Madam CEO. All right. Sorry, I just wanted to wrap up the uh, the Western Hall route. So I think we've we've got the um, local improvements, uh, private roads section done, right? So, um, I heard some numbers saying you wanted to take it out. So we took out the naming of where it would go. Uh, I would recommend that you leave the verbiage in though. So if we do get a new quarry down the road and we don't have a road, but we have it in our plan, then that gives us some leverage to work with them to say, yeah, we know we need one, but we don't have the money. And if you want to come to the table and uh, and help us with it. So I, I think that gives you some more leeway down the down the future. So I'm not sure you want to pull that out. Uh, Ever council comment. Thank you. I agree. I went back and saw my okay. I just wanted to wrap that up yeah, just so it yes. kind of got left it, hanging. It, it may be something for the future and yes we don't want them in our urban areas. Thank you very much. Carry on the okay. chart. Thanks. Yeah, so through the chair, maybe just um, on the screen here, this is the bullet I believe CAO is referring yeah. to, and, and it is. It, it was one of the more significant recommendations of the plan to think about a one-day future, maybe not definitely paid for by seven residents, but imposed onto new aggregate act applications, that we have a westerly utility direction all route challenge. And you know it's abundantly clear we, we know that from division road warmest or side road door burn um and so on you know so that is the okay okay so i I think we're okay to uh, update it that one when we come to uh, transportation as point two. Okay, uh, member Cox and I think member Minnings, have you have you signed up too? Yeah. Through the chair. Uh, on this section right here, it says through an improved sidewalk network as well as improved circulation to and from recreational trails, which I can agree. Various project soldier, shoulder paving bike lanes and signed bike loop. Um, I don't remember seeing, and it, it is in there later, I think, but I, I just want to pop this to you. Coldwater Road from um, Timbermart area in Wild Highway 12, there, there is a small lane now that I think is considered a bike lane. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that that's clean and, and, and lined better if, and then that way it's done. But I'm going back to my same story at Greenwood Landing. The sidewalk that leads to nowhere. And we need to have, I don't care if we have to go to the, the developers, but that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. The sidewalk comes out to go on a road, one of the busiest roads we have with speeding issues and goes nowhere and then across the front lawn over there is the sidewalk. So I really have a concern with that sidewalk coming up and taking children up there. And and somebody said, well, they can cut through the parking lot. Well, that is even worse, no offense. So I, if you could just note that, if we could maybe have a discussion with the developers or have that as something that's a priority, because when those families go in there, I know a lot of the kids are going to take that back, back forward walk route, but there still is a sidewalk that leads to nowhere. <laughs> 
Go ahead, then, Derek. Uh, thank you. And through the chair, so I'm actually just scrolling through recommendations, and um, that was brought up with our consultants, and they felt that you know it is a dead end for sure, but it probably wasn't you know one of them. It was actually what they had recommended to us was Gill Street. So Gill Street connecting where it left off from um, Greenwood Acres down to Coldwater Road, but we could add you know in the in the Gill Street area um, that we extend it through the food land as well. That could be an addition to the AT project list. If you don't mind, because I know the consultant looks at the picture, but I watch people and, and that's a busy lane. Now we're saying to people walk along that lane and bike along that lane and then there's no sidewalk. Thank you. Okay, member, member meeting, sorry. Thank you through the chair on page uh, B, so page five, sorry. Um, uh, under development uh, or provincial plans at the bottom, because it's in this plan, um, the consultation with MTO regarding the overall Highway 11, I'm wondering if uh, you can provide some context. So there's it's, it, it's, I think, the only one that has no dollar figures, um, maybe one or two associated with it in this entire table. And it's important enough to be in the plan, but I, I'd like you to speak to that. Uh, sorry, just a clarity. What project number would it be? Yeah. Uh, provincial RDP1 provincial and then RDP2. Uh, Thank you to the chair. Um, yeah, so th those two projects are not necessarily Severn projects, um, but they would be certainly uh, a lobby to the province <clears throat> to consider pushing Highway 11 further, I guess it would be west, away from West Shore now to remove, I think there's like 11 ins and outs along that stretch. And if you look at the map that is showing collision history, um, we have a significant, even at a provincial level, of collisions along that stretch due to those those ins and outs, and you know the increasing uh, traffic on Highway 11 North. Um, there will be eventually, and unfortunately, the, the uh, Ministry of Transportation hasn't released their final plans on a six-lane highway. But we know North of Wachago is a six-lane highway, and South of Raleigh really is a six-lane highway, and in between them is most likely going to be a six-lane highway. So if we continue to lobby the MTO with recommendations and comments and a transportation master plan and identify a problem, um, we'd like to see them push further to the west to create a service road out of what is now 11 and uh, an entirely new six lane highway uh, further west, um, giving a bit of buffer between the town and could even result in a bit of commercial you know, road. Uh, adjacent to highway commercial areas and stuff like that. But that, that's the intent is we saw that there was a problem in the existing transportation network in that area. And uh, we tried to come up with a solution to it. Thank you, Dr. Pond, for your supplemental question and then Member Burkett. Um, just on that same page, RV, the eight is Port Stanton, not station. Sorry, that's a oh. valley right. there. <laughs> and then on the medium term, 18.14, it's not big cheap, but it's mid -state. Sorry, that's just me. A member meetings and a member of the Thank you. I have a supplementary. In that same section, RDP 1.2, uh, it does have a $25 million price next to it, and it's, it speaks to a service road south of um, proposed Highway 11 realignment. Is this um, dollar amount just a holding? amount like an, an estimate as to something in the future and the other thing based on your explanation uh, previously which was great thank you is that part of this 20-year um, visionary scope that uh, the TMP is is um, based on mm -hmm. so through the chair um, the, the, I think the answer to the first question is all of these estimates are kind of what you consider order of magnitude um, we took a, a per kilometer level uh, cost estimate that's been generated from you know bidding practices over the last five years or so, and applied them you know kind of with a brush. 
And so these are plus or minus a pretty significant quantity because we haven't done design. We don't even really have, you know, the alternative selected. It's just to give an order of magnitude of, of the level of investment that might be required for these kinds of projects. Um, they are in the provincial plans category, so we haven't assigned a year. Like we haven't assigned a priority at all because it's 100% dependent on the on the province accelerating a project. Thank you, Member for Canada, Member Jensen. Thank you, through the chair, Derek, RDP 8, RDP 9, and then RDP 22. So my concern is, again, someone reading this won't go to the summary and note that it's driven mm -hmm. by the residents and the cost would be work would be residents that are that are benefiting from it and you've got a cost in here and the Claire's Bridge Lane again someone looking at this without knowing that there's a summary at the end would would see a 5.2 million dollar tag and think that we're paying for it without some sort of notation here and we have the all route extension westerly of highway 12 well it doesn't state where it is but we've got cost associated to it 26. <laughs> it's not working. Um, I, I think based on what I what I'm hearing, we can take the table and reformat it to you know we can maybe put some columns or so I, I could see it a couple of different ways. So I think we can clarify who's paying for what in in just a different way so that it's clear because that you're quite right and people won't get past the summary. It's a 500 page document. So if we clarify it up front, I think that will. So can you bring up that RD with the but uh, members you got was talking about, can we go to the long term, like go back up that page a bit? Yeah. Yeah, so you've got that taken out. Okay, perfect. And then you get to that in the section. Okay, yeah, Member Jansen. Thank you, um, <clears throat> through the chair. Um, there's a, a couple of items on here uh, related to uh, my work. Um, RDP 6, the pedestrian crossover. At Gray Street, Parting uh, Coldwater Public School. I think this is a great idea. Um, I, I just I would like to ensure that it is, um, uh, I guess, a full. Uh, the arms go over the road as opposed to just beside the road because we have the same issue on uh, on Coldwater Road. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And I just because of, you know. I just want to remind that this this document doesn't design any of these solutions, and so you know it is just identifying that there would be a, a good candidate project in the area given the school and Gray Street's kind of collector like function. Um, traffic counts following the Ontario Traffic Manual for deciding um, what treatment would be there would be our first step, and we know from previous councils that. Um, you know, we've taken it a step further in most instances of pedestrian crossings and went to a much higher standard. So, whereas it might often just recommend a level D, a sign, and some paint, uh, you know, we've gone and put up, you know, in uh, mid block pedestrian signals, right? Like in March block. So, um, that's all to be happened. The first step is just to identify that there's a concern. Okay, so. <clears throat> Supplemental. Uh, so looking down further in the report for the points 14 and 15, um, those would be projects, sorry, those would be projects that, uh, um, as you described earlier uh, in our meeting, uh, would have some social disruption and uh, would take uh, a public consultation into consideration. I know they're a lot longer term and uh, so they'd be discussed prior to moving forward. I see. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Member Cox. And I don't know, it might be a thing, something here. Um, on the next page, which is uh, active transportation network implementation, it's got Carly Online, Pay Shoulders. When is that for? Through the chair. Um, so, Carly Online, Pay Shoulders, and Brody Drive, Pay page Shoulders, are in the short term because they're actually well underway. Um, those two projects have been in the design phase for about two years now, and we have uh, about $150,000 in the capital budget for utility relocations on Carly Online, as the um, bell poles on the south side 
uh, basically a button up to the paved shoulder. Um, that that's effectively why that's there. Um, what was the other? Sorry, I didn't no, that's that's it. But I I have so this is not going to slow down currently because we told those people it's going to be getting next year. Through, through the chair, no, it's in the short term, which is kind of the zero to five. So if we knew that there was a project there, we we put it in this plan because it is still a growth related uh, or capacity improvement kind of. Uh, project. It's not like we're just replacing the existing exact same cross section. So that's why it's listed in. Okay, but that's like my, my question is <clears throat> that is not going to slow that down because we have promised those people that it would get patched and then it would be done next year. Uh, through the chair. So there there are some challenges relocating Bell. We're working with those utilities to accelerate that so that we can uh, achieve construction for next year. Um, Stephen, except you know some non-passage of capital plan for the 2024 season, it is our intent to to put that project forward in 24. So this is just a personal. I mean, everybody else can take in if they want. If we have to wait till 2026 or 2025, I would prefer just to pay the car down and come back because these people that road is the worst road I've ever seen anywhere, and you know we all know that. But I mean, we I, I mean I came back and asked. Three times, and I was told this is what I can tell them. And no offense, it's very frustrating when they're having, you know, incidents with their vehicle. Thank you, uh, Member Bennings, and then Member Brennan, and then Member Burkett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On um, page, I don't know, HVI, so table number. Um, sorry, it's so small emergency. Uh, ES two. Um, short term, medium term, long term. So my question regards to AT8, AT9, um, AT18 and AT19. So um, they do have five block improvements in those areas. My question is, why are they in the medium and long term stages and not within the next five years. Specifically, some of the ones I mentioned. So the first AT1, AT, sorry, AT8, 9, 18, and 19. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so I've got highlighted here the active transportation related projects in the uh, West Shore area. And the projects for the medium term Bay Gold Steam uh, multi use path is in the six to 10 year because of what it does. Um, so it currently, you know, those connections would serve a larger population in an area that's further away from, um, you know, what we call sort of downtown West Shore. And so there, in the medium term, it means that they've been prioritized higher just in the plan, not reflecting our current capital output. Because you'll see here that AT18, the Bay Road sidewalk, is actually slated for design this year. Right? So that, that's in a design pattern for this year. It's been uh, allocated a budget, and uh, we're retaining a consultant to do that design with us. So even though it says long term, in terms of priority of this plan, our actual capital plan, which drive what we physically do, uh, is putting it at, at design in 20. So that, there's the difference is the, the priority rather than what we're physically completing. There's nothing that says you couldn't take a job way into the long term plan, like let's say Cold Water Road bike lane, and accelerate it to 24's capital plan. Thank you, supplementary. So, um, I'm not understanding then why why they're broken down like this if they could actually be moved up and down in the in the design. It's just I, I just need to understand how they end up in the short term, medium term, long term. And then that's my first question. And then specific to the Bayou Road sidewalk, it appears twice both in medium term and long term. So if you could speak to me about what that difference is. Yeah, through the chair, um, the Bayou Road sidewalk twice is better to see the map um, because Bayou is a long road 
And so there's sort of this first section between Cumberland Road and Hedgefield Landing, uh, which is in um, design phase for 23. And then of course, Bayview Road actually carries along all the way down to West Road Crest. And uh, we've identified Bay Road as, you know, he collects a lot of this population kind of living at the south end of, of West York, um, or at least the first south end, I guess the next south end is Nathan Minogue. But, um, you know, up through and into the interchange. So that's why we would recommend it have a sidewalk because it acts as a collector like road. <clears throat> Thank you. And finally, when I look at, um, sorry, page 107, 7.32, the pedestrian facilities, specifically sidewalks, that section's focused on. And it states that high priority locations within the vicinity of schools, trails, community centers should be prioritized. So I'm still not understanding, and I'm, I'm glad they're in the design phase, um, but the chart doesn't tell me which section of Bayou is in the design phase and which isn't, because one is certainly um, a feeder street along Bayou, which is a um, busy street, as we know, to a school. So through the chair, um, first, the, the section about sidewalks and that it, our consultant said basically that you know, to prioritize around schools, walk zones within schools, so we've got those the county central school board and community centers was a priority. Because it ends up on the chart here at all, means that it is a priority, even if it's in the long term. What we're not recommending is sidewalks on, you know, Crescent Bay or um, South Sparrow Lake at the back end near, you know, Fort Bend and stuff like that. We, we are trying to prioritize the investment. We can't put sidewalks everywhere. And uh, that was, that's what that statement is sort of about. The fact that it's on the chart means that it was prioritized in the long term in the plan, yeah, even if it's 11 and 20 years old. Okay, I took <coughs> member Minnings and then uh, okay, uh, I have member Brennan and then member Burkett. Thank you to the chair, Mr. Derek. I just wanted to echo the, uh, the deputy mayor's concerns with regard to Carly on. We need to do Carly on as soon as possible. And I would agree, even if that means we would have to sacrifice some of the great things that are proposed for there for some other long term period. But um, <laughs> there's a single person in the that won't agree that we need to pay it. And we need to do this for many people on that. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Burkett. Thank you through the chair, Derek. So just, uh, I hate to dwell on Carlyon, but we're not handcuffed based on waiting for Bell Canada. We can do this project as far as widening for cyclists or, or paving that extra five feet or six feet in a future year. But looking at resurfacing that area as far as maybe next year, hopefully, we're not handcuffed by having this in the document. Thank you. Through the chair, and just, I, I think I sound like I'm repeating myself, but um, the capital plan is what council directs staff to do. And so, you know, if 2024's capital plan has a project that says re uh, reconstruct, it's not just a resurfacing that ever required more, but reconstruct the roadway and work on the paved shoulders and widening at a later date. You know, that would be the project that staff would undertake. You know, on an approved capital plan. Okay, Member Cox and Member <clears throat> Jackson. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify for uh, Council Member Means. When, when you see these here, as you can just see from Carly, what will happen sometimes is at a budget meeting, you may bring forward, we're having an issue on Bay Road, the kids are walking along the side, it's now a safety issue. Quickly, Council goes, oh, you're right, and it's here, but we move it up. And, and any of these roads, just like we talked about Carly on, yes, it's got a bike path, but we realize it's a it's a, a road that really needs to be fixed. So we can direct and say to staff, you know what, let's just get this done and if we have to add on, we will. So that's how a lot of these things move. So as much as they're here, if if something happens and we get a, a complaint or we see an issue in the wards, then we can bring it forward and staff will help us with it. Thank you, Member Jansen. 
Thank you. And through the chair, um, just to mention uh, the micro land drive uh, improvements. I know they're a little bit longer term, um, including uh, uh, adding sidewalks as part of the uh, active uh, transportation network. Um, I know also later on in the report, it talked about uh, possible purchase of the bowling alley. Yeah. And just like you mentioned, that's also the town's laundry mat. Um, something to consider, uh, it's uh, quite uh, well used. Um, but uh, what I'd like to see is some traffic calming measures uh, take place around the area of the arena um, to the bowling alley or just past the bowling alley area. Um, the bowling alley is located uh, directly on the <laughs> side. And uh, the concern is that a child or, or anybody could uh, exit quickly uh, as a car's uh, you know, coming by. It's not very, uh, uh, people don't uh, normally speed on that road, but it, it's, uh, I, I identify it as a safety issue. Okay, uh, Eric. Okay, thank you to the chair. And I told myself I wouldn't bounce around through this document, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I'm in, <laughs> in, in our report, um, our consultant was really good. They, they sort of said, you know, you don't actually have a traffic calming policy. So while you're making decisions on, you know, the center lane delineators and um, there are some, you know, traffic pain opportunities, solar uh, feedback signs, which tell you how fast you're going. Uh, we have both semi-permanent and portable versions of that. Um, and we generally have not used speed humps or bumps, whatever you want to call them, um, in the township, but that's really not off the table. What they recommended to us as part of this plan is in the policy section, why don't you create a traffic calling policy that fits Severn, that can address some of the traffic um, operating speeds that you have in, in a systematic way. So we actually have a draft ready following the, you know, the completion of this plan to present to council on how best to address traffic calming in seven, a made for seven approach. I think on that, I'm gonna call it Denver Parks and then we'll take a break. I just wanted to thank Eric for that because those are 65% of my complaints is the speeding and the traffic calming and what ideas can we come up with? And, and I had told some people that I would even speak to here, so that's great to know. Thank you very much. Thank you, so let's uh, take a, a break here for 10 minutes and come back 1035, if that's okay. Thank you.
Okay, we'll go and then we'll start uh, member for cap. Thank you. Continuing on page five, can we go to uh, item number two? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, item number two, we have five point one one two point 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 one all route extension westerly to Highway 12. Oh, okay. And we don't know where it's going. I don't know. I don't think we need a price associated with it, but can we reword it? The same way we had it reworded uh, in previous documents. Yes, no, there's a it out for them. Okay. If I may, for the chair. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Chair. Yeah. Chair Teller, may I address that? I don't see you, yeah. Thank you. It's very vague, right? It's the same as what we talked about before, was we wanted to have it in there in case there's a new quarry come and allows us to work with them on it. So it's, it's worded the same as the earlier word one is. There's nothing specific in it. Um, we took out the, the Thornburn references and just to talk about at some point, we might need a, an additional haul route should we have a new quarry cup. So it's deliberately vague. The pepper for cap. Thank you. So do we need a place to attach to it because we don't know where it's going to go? Or do we need the price in? Go ahead, Ed, Gary. Yeah, through the chair. Um, so the pricing in all of these projects is, is really just to give an idea. So I guess no, right? Like if we took it out, it would have really no bearing on identifying the challenge we have with the transportation network. It would it would not preclude us to bring these challenges to any new ARA app applications. You know, so I think that's a fair compromise is to remove the value and effectively not pick any solution, but identify clearly that there is a problem. Any yeah, it, um, if I could go to uh, the active transportation one, the BI6, um, when it's, it's development RDP4 for the next page, it's on that, uh, the next page, the active transportation network. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it starts with the bottom, right at the bottom actually. Oh, it's the bottom. RDP yeah. I, I just have a question on this one, the development driven. It says noted with the road network implication. So this development driven, that's always, paid, is that paid by developer then? Or is that we have to pay? Like I'm assuming it's this is development driven paid by the developer, right? So through the chair, um, that particular project is Paid for by the developer in part through mm -hmm. development charge. Yes. Okay. So, but it is in terms of timing, it's development driven. Yeah. So, if there was no development, we wouldn't have. We wouldn't okay. do that product. Okay. So, what I what I sorry what I what I would like to ask then is if this is development driven, is that something that probably would be in the next couple of years due to the fact that we can only have that playground there? Thank you. Yeah. So through the chair, the development on the Milky Beach Road is occurring. So because it's occurring, it, it creates a, a shorter timeline for completion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify that. Thanks. Okay, we'll uh, proceed then, Derek. Uh, here, please. Oh, sorry, never made. Sorry. Thank you, through the chair. So on that same table, ES2, the um, sorry, medium term, what is it, AT15, AT15, um, Souls Road and Telford Line Overpass has a cost associated with it. Um, and is it for, it says it's under active transportation. What exactly is that for? Because I, I believe that that bridge had some significant work done it over the past uh, recent years. Through the chair, so the AT components, they look like they're a smaller dollar value figure because it's in a, in certain instances, it's just line paint. Um, our standard, and you'll see it later on in the document about how we address cycling facilities. 
The, the province has come up with a variety of treatments to address cycling facilities, including buffer cycling lanes, elevated cycling lanes, um, you know, a number of very expensive treatments, but we are still in a rural, uh, typically low volume um, type environment. And so we are permitted to do things like simply pave the shoulder and provide line striping to give cyclists an area to cycle, but not fully dedicate the facility to it. And so at Souls and Telford Line, um, the ministry just did a, a rehabilitation project on that bridge, but they did not physically widen that bridge. There is an existing um, pedestrian, you know, small area on, I believe, the north side that would be utilized to cross the bridge. But what these improvements are for the parts of Severn Homes, which are the overpass ramps coming up and down from the Centre Ave, Division Road, and Sewell's Line, uh, or Sewell's Road, sorry. Um, to provide a paved shoulder around those areas. <coughs> Thank you. And I, I have a supplementary question. 1819 Highview Avenue, Coronation Avenue sidewalks. Um, my question is why Coronation Avenue? Um, there are a number of feeder streets, and I'm just curious as to what happened. Uh, so through the chair, when we get to the map, it might be a bit easier to see, but the consultant recommended to us that providing sidewalks on all of the, and you're right, they're kind of like feeder streets, or the streets between Lakeside and Cumberland, um, is probably excessive. There are a few channelized locations that we could alternate. Um, you know, little road segments, and in certain areas there was less obstacles uh, to install sidewalks. So that's kind of why the recommendations are there. If it ended up being a different road or a different set of um, alternating sidewalks, then you know certainly that would resolve the concern. This is what the consultant said would be the more ideal version of uh, you know providing that link. And you'll see that there is a recommendation to go down Lakeside as well. So Lakeside being in parallel to Cumberland and the Highway. Um, and kind of acts as a north-south um, route through the entire thing. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Cox. Just to yeah. quick, it's the same page. It's on <coughs> Boss Street in Avery Lane. It says development driven. Here, is that something that we would look at short-term or long-term? Uh, through the chair, so it would be completely development driven. We have um, actually just recently received an application at the bottom of Sheridan. Um, which could tie into the connection of, of Shaw, and um, so that that's why we identified those as you know kind of dependent on. It, it's a if we had a, had a plan like this back in the Greenwood Acres days, yeah. we we would have been able to more firmly say, you know, this okay. is part of our development driven identified future growth problems, and the development needs to help us solve that. So in that case, you know what, I, I do understand all that, but especially for the development journal one, that's a good thing to happen because it gives the next people the, the kick to be able to say, yeah. this is how we want it and this is how you have to do it. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, Mayor Mays. So just a general question, and um, that's it for my questions on this section. When we're looking at a road, for example, Minogi, but there are others in these two tables, where it speaks to improvements around sidewalks or multi-use plan or paved shoulders or a variety of different things even though they're listed separately in this document further in the plan it states that work being done on one street should be done comprehensively so that everything should be done together from a cost saving um, and less duplication effort so if you could just speak to is that the intent going forward Absolutely. Um, you know, having a plan like this and having maps on staff walls that show the future um, recommended transportation related improvements. When when we're helping to guide council in what would be a renewal activity, we won't we won't miss the opportunity to combine those two projects together. And you know, that's going to obviously create better infrastructure at a lower dollar value. And uh, and that's why the the timing in here really is. Is an estimate because renewal might drive a project, but let's not miss what has been identified in here to include in the project as an opportunity. 
Yeah, if, you, if we're looking at development driven, then would, would that be something we look at also on the Anderson line for that new 40 home one? Is it indicated anywhere? Uh, through the chair, so it's it's very close to um, uh, John Lens, yeah, and uh, it's it's almost so close that it's inherently included. But you're right; that would be an example where there are some external works that would be required by the development to make sure that they are connected to the pedestrian system. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any comments, or can we move to the transportation master plan in front? Go ahead, Derek. If you want to, you know, lead through there. Any comments from the committee will be accepted. Thank you to the chair. Yeah. So the first, now we're into the body of the report. So we skimmed past the uh, table of contents, um, got through the executive summary, made some changes in there. Um, and now, while we look at the first part here, it does try to explain, you know, what the transportation stage master plan does. Also, uh, references how, um, you know, we do look to engage the public as, as many times as possible and uh, effectively this is to tie back to what currently still unapproved but approved by council um, the update to the official plan so that in trying to build that relationship between the two um, very planning level documents the official plan and then the subsequent master plans like recreation master plan and the servicing master plan exercise we're undertaking now to support that official so that's what the introduction is about Um, I'll keep going and, and maybe just saying one stop me. Uh, so geographical context, you know, where we are and where we are in relation to the province, right? So that's important to recognize, um, you know, how how Severance fits in the, in the overall scheme of transportation. You know, just because there's a municipal border there doesn't mean that the car stops, it, it goes through. I have a quick question on that one. It's just a uh, fellow line. It, it says it's private as well as open side will be private, but in reality, it's just that uh, it's unassumed roads, but it's not private. So I think it's not correct. So, through, through the chair, if I can, um, that's an example again where you know we have, and there's few, very few instances, but it, it would be considered a private road on municipal property, completely done through by the, the licensed occupation. And so, like Copeland's, for instance, the end of lots, lots of life is that example where you have, um, you know, a road on a municipal property through license of occupation, maybe trivial maintenance, uh, but the remaining of Copeland's uh, lane is fully private, private on private. And so we have very few instances of the first, um, quite a bit of instances like Swift Rapids Road, um, a big one for us is Ormat Road, um, all of those, those major well, they're all private roads on private roads. I know we have some roads that are trivial maintenance, it's like five or six. So yeah. Yeah. And we're getting. <laughs> Thank you, through the chair. I'm not sure if on the maps, West Shore could be spelt as one word and not two. I know that those maps were prepared by the consultant. Yeah, through the chair, um, we did have a couple of renamings for um, Wood Bay Road. And I saw that Port San was for station, so we'll we'll make sure to correct that. And I can amend these maps to make sure that the final draft has West Shore. Yeah, I just have another question. And so, how does one get a road on the master plan? I'm thinking of uh, 
uh, Narrows Road, for instance, which is uh, currently paved and it's uh, in deteriorating condition. So is that on this plan or is that a capital plan? Uh, the same thing would apply to Kinnear Side Road. It's uh, we hard top that road maybe 15, 20 years ago and uh, people still use it. We have the vision to maintain what we've got. So to the chair, um, that's a good time to bring up, you know, the difference between this plan and other um, what we call like asset management or renewal right. forecast. Um, so this plan really does not even look at all the, the existing assets condition. Um, it's not the purpose of the plan. That would be more for the roads need study to identify, you know, we have 400 kilometers of road, X amount is in good shape, X amount is kind of in poor shape. And with the fiscal um, amount that we can expend per year, these are the recommended roads to address. That, that's a condition related conversation. This is very much just a um, transportation challenge and new additions, like completely new infrastructure to support those challenges. And winnings. <clears throat> Thank you, and through the chair, that, um, that sort of makes me have to ask the question about the roads need, the road needs study RNS that's referenced and the, this transportation master plan. So in the road needs study, it states that it is used as a guide when determining priority of future road improvements, et cetera. Whereas the transportation master plan says that it's a visionary document and outlines process. So I think that's where I would, I'm still struggling as not, focusing too much on the priority items, which are short, medium, long-term, that are throughout the transportation master plan, whereas I would think those priorities should be in the road needs study, and this should be a laundry list of all the roads that need attention, and not with any of those short, medium, long-term. If you could help me understand um, why we're seeing those priority terms in the transportation master plan, so um, I, I, I think I can best sum it up by every challenge has like a order of impact and also an estimated time. So you'll see a lot of the long-term plans like the 10 and 20 year are, are things that are only now becoming a problem. Some of the short-term stuff is, is an ongoing, we've probably talked about it for 20 years kind of challenge and it's only exacerbated and you know, it's getting worse uh, now, so that's where the priority comes in, and and a lot of the jobs too do still tie back to development. So where we know that development is being quite successful in Severn is going to drive a shorter term recommendation in this plan. Quite the contrary for the roads needs plan. The roads needs plan looks at a priority guide number, and it says if you're going to invest a million dollars into the road network, what investment is going to be your best value? in terms of whether it's the right time for the treatment, the right amount of benefit, like traffic volumes or um, the roadway function, what it does for the community, that's where you get priorities on the road renewal side of things. I hope, I, does that, is that close to the difference between the two uh, timing bases? Well, thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mayor Mays. Yeah, thank you. I'm still a bit murky, but I would, I'm hopefully going to get more clarity as we go on. Thank you. Thank you, Member Cox. Oh, Madam CEO first. Thank you. I was going to give it a try, and um, Derek can correct me if I don't have it right, but the Roads Needs Studies looks at existing assets. The Transportation Master Plan looks at improvements we need to make to things in the future. So Roads Needs just maintaining what we have. This is looking at additional problems that we have and a longer term plan. That make more sense? I was going to throw my two cents worth in, and it's also for funding. So we can look ahead to make plans to either look for grants or funding or how we're going to pay for this or development charges from development and all those types of things. I, I guess if I'd like to move, move to the consultation process, if everybody wants to finish here. Okay, you want to go through? Go through uh, okay. I, all I want to say is somewhere I would like it written in the future. The council be put on. It says here. Um, 
this teacher too. Uh, with the public as well as stakeholders, and um, it was never a council, and I also feel that possibly it, it should also be put in that there's probably a good discussion to have with your road staff too. You, like the public works administrator and your public works department should have a one, and council should all be brought in separately like we did at the Master Transport, uh, the Master Recreation Plan. Thank you. Good, Derek. Uh, go ahead, Derek. Thank you to the chair. Um, cer certainly each process has, and each consultant has their own sort of style, but at the very bottom of this document, there's a section that calls future TMP updates. And it, and it does reflect that this is a living document that we're gonna be back to it in another five years because things change. And, uh, and we'll just continue to update this long range forecast so that it doesn't become out of date. And in there, I wonder if we should add a section that says the next TMP update is going to include, you know, a more direct council-based interview process, and that could be embedded right into this document, so that the next consultant will read this document and get instruction from it. And supplementary <clears throat> with the master transportation <clears throat> plan, probably every other year or so, you just pull it out, take a look at it. And you, you, you sort of say, finish, 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 and, and if there's anything new or development driven, put on. Because I think our other master transportation plans, no offense, got developed, <laughs> and we didn't look at them until we got into this one, which probably is the reason why, and we have new people on our, our council too, is that it's all be going through because we did never do that before. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Dark, were you any a certain? I remember Brookett well, while you're Thank you, uh, through the chair. <coughs> Derek, I know that we had, I can't remember where I read it now, but it showed how many quarries uh, we have now. I'm curious why we didn't uh, mention the Patterson quarry that's back on Grass Lake Line and the Siler one that's on. Is it up to the here? The Siler one that's on uh, South Square Lake Road. It's not part of this. So through the chair, um, all of the mapping that came from the Ministry of Natural Resources. So they keep maps of any licensed extraction locations, whether it be in sort of a holding pattern, a lot of pits and quarries get a license, but they don't actually extract um, currently. They have a license to do so later. Um, so all of those were included in this plan. We didn't include um, licenses that may have expired and invoked, you know, that sort of thing. And in the chart that talked about all the major aggregate producers, you know, uh, we didn't include everyone because we do have a lot of um, sort of unused right now um, aggregate uh, licenses. Throughout the, throughout the township, but they could become used, you know, within no time. So just the, the main list is the main next course, is what I guess we had. All right. That, sorry, that list is on page 36 in the paper copy that I have. Table 2.8. Yeah. The chair just said um, the page is now about public stakeholder engagement. And um, in this section, we just described the process that we took to try to um, encourage engagement in the process. So we did publish a notice of study commencement that's required by the municipal class EA process. Um, we did a couple online surveys. We got we got some feedback, but I think you know it's fair to say that almost all of the public engagement processes we do, um, we, we we get some, but we don't get them. And uh, we do our best. Um, it is still. You know, an offer. We can't force the community to provide comment. And uh, we did a couple of public information centers. Uh, they were hosted online and available on YouTube. And then the final draft uh, to the to council in April. Um, we're looking now to do stu notice of study completion. So once we are happy with the document um, under the uh, the Mr. Plat DA process, uh, we do publish something called a notice of study completion. So we're done. This is the this is the document that's endorsed by council, which is the most important document, and uh, and then the public is able to easily access and reference that document. Uh, thank you, Pepper Mays. Um, thank you through the chair. Yeah, I too was um, surprised. I was surprised and a bit disappointed at the online results. Um, I think there was a hundred and some odd uh, respondents. 
to the, to the consultants out of about 14,000 residents, which is um, it, it's really an insignificant response, I think. But um, my question is, when the consultants said that um, they use uh, on page nine, all of their, they said several promotional methods. And I'm just questioning that because going forward, as you said, we're going to uh, re-engage the public on the, on the, the ongoing plan. So it, in the appendix where it showed um, the promotional methods and the engagement with the public, it was web-based on the township's website. And there was one article in Aurelia Matters, I believe. Now, I'm not 100% clear on the frequency of mail-outs for water bills or tax bills, et cetera, to residents. I know that there's a newsletter uh, that goes into um, the sent out across the, the township at regular intervals. Was it also included in that mail out, that actual paper? And if it could be considered going forward if it wasn't? Well, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so through the chair, I actually can't recall if we put it in the mail out, um, but for sure, you know, going forward, we try to use any avenue we can to publicize and promote. Um, you know, engagement into these processes. And certainly we did circulate to a stakeholders list as well. So, you know, the uh, uh, MTO and the, uh, uh, I believe the school boards and things like that were reached out to, um, but that is only a stakeholders uh, contact list. Thank you, Madam CEO. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to cover sort of engagement overall. That hundred and some that engage, that is actually sadly pretty typical for us. If you looked at our recreation master plan or our official plan, you wouldn't find that it's much different. People just aren't engaged in what their municipalities do. And we do all the social media. Um, if the timing works on our meetings, we do put it in our mail outs, but we only have taxes twice a year. So, and, and we're not convinced that people actually pull that out and read it either, but we, we take every channel that we can and we promote it. Um, but you know, we, we, we can't make people engaged. And that's very common in all municipalities. It's not a severin problem. I've talked about it at, a, at the council table at the last two municipalities I've used, I've worked at, and they have the same problems, but we, we can't make people engage. We can put it out there for them and, and hope they engage. But the, the number, although low, pretty standard for what we normally get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, um, I want to be part of that partnership team in helping to communicate and engage residents. Certainly, in our areas, there are other social media avenues and more informal ones that um, I'd be happy to support when I'm out talking to people, et cetera. So, um, I think we all own that. Um, but uh, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. For uh, this section two here. Okay, thank you to the chair. Um, so this is uh, the next section. It's just about existing conditions. So the consultants uh, looked at you know what what is your your existing township transportation system comprised of, and uh, we basically did a, a tour around Severn. Um, took, took them to every nook and cranny that we could find in Severn, and really exposed the transportation network uh, to our to our consultants. Um, we provided a number of background documents. So. The official plan, the, the, uh, the adopted one, the 2010, um, was the primary thing to reference. Um, we had some other transportation plans throughout the years, West Shore Area Transportation Plan um, that was done in 2010, and uh, the Rose Heat Study from RJ Burnside in 2017, which is still very uh, renewal focused, but we gave that plan to the consultants to make sure um, they were abundantly aware of, of our plans for renewal. Um, engineering design guidelines, this is critical that it sets what we typically produce as transportation assets, like right down to the, the width of a sidewalk, um, how many uh, meters are in the driven lane of a roadway, um, all of those parameters are set in the engineering design guidelines, which is uh, produced in 2014. And then of course the other kind of financial related documents like development charge background studies, and these documents are uh, effectively a spin-off from a master plan. So a master plan says we, you know, to accommodate growth, we need X, X, and X. Um, the background study says, well, we need to pay for that somehow. 
Um, so here are the charges benefit to existing and benefit to development, and here are the fees that contribute to the overall development charge, like a new home would pay to, to be here instead. Um, yeah, and, and we went through, and we also went through the municipal transportation master plan. So at the time, Stantex uh, 2019 report versus the city of Aurelia, uh, Vermeer Township's uh, plan for 2010, and uh, the County of Simcoe's uh, transportation master plan, which is actually undergoing an update uh, at the same time. Um, highway or existing road jurisdictions. So we looked at you know who who exists as a road authority in Severn, and of course we have the provincial highway system, uh, 411 and 12, and the county road system, 16, 17, 23, 52, and 1. Um, we looked at traffic volumes. Traffic volumes are are like the most important data when evaluating your transportation network. And so part of the process included an update to a number of traffic counts, uh, intersection turning movement counts, and also a recommendation later for staff and Severn to continue to develop an onboarding monitoring program. Um, you have saw Alex come in, he's our public works technician. Uh, he operates the machine that count cars uh, throughout Severn, and once in a while you'll drive across uh, some tubes or uh, see a, a device mounted to a pole, and it's collecting data then all the time. Um, so we can monitor the traffic volumes on our on our net. Is this too detailed? Are we okay? <laughs> and so the maps um, kind of show the estimated traffic counts throughout the township. And you'll see here that most of our roads are green, and green means low, uh, very low actually, uh, between 550 and 500 cars a day. Um, in the grand scheme of things, you know that is considered. Uh, you know, basically just a residential roadway. And then, so we only have a few that trigger, you know, the 2,000 to even 3,000 um, cars a day, which are collector and arterial roads for us, something that you would see similar to uh, a county or regional paper. Um, we do have a speed limits uh, map, which just shows a lot of the unposted 80, you know, through the rural uh, section of the community. Um, you can see a lot of that and, and you can see why we do have an unposted um, option through the highway traffic deck because providing the signage required for all those roads is an, is an extremely um, large quantity of signage, uh, you know, for, for all those yellows. But in the reds and in the uh, other colors there, um, that's where we perform studies and find that we need a lower or higher posted speed limit to match the, the physical environment that, that is being uh, offered in the road, roadway. Um, we do have uh, a list here about some of the anticipated growth on highways and uh, where what kind of growth patterns. 1.8 to 2% per year is typical. And that's actually throughout the entire province. And what we see on our roads. So that's traffic. The county uh, gave us some traffic counts as well. We did some analysis to see what kind of growth patterns they see on those roadways. And it's interesting to note that some of the roadways actually have a negative growth for you. Um, their, their studies um, you know, had more volumes in one couple of years than, than later years. Um, not too sure why, but it was interesting to know. Thank you. Um, for the chair, so on page 19, um, there's quite 2.3.3. So, um, so, I highlighted County Road 52 uh, from the 10th side road of Romero to Muskoka Road. It's got a very high uh, growth per year, and if you could just speak to that, I'm not familiar with what's happening in the Severn area with that. As far as what would what would trigger that growth, if you have any kind of so through the chair, um, we actually did not pr produce uh, an analysis on those growth patterns. Um, the road authority may have, so we can certainly reach out to county road or to the county road system and see what that might have been, but. Um, no, that as part of this plan, we didn't uh, explore that. I think uh, Member Cox can speak to that. Well, I was thinking maybe Member Keck could. That's up at the Shago. That's 69. That's true. The ones that we had written. Remember, we had 
Have them do extra counts on that. Yeah, go ahead, Member Burkett. Through the chair, if I may, so that's in the area where our street light, yeah. our new street light is, and to warrant the having street lights there, we did have the county counters, but more so on the weekend because they were doing it off season, but. Those numbers are relatively low. Look, uh, yeah. the Skoka Road to Highway Number Eleven, like relatively low compared to what I saw, like fifteen thousand on a busy July weekend is what you would see. Sorry, just I, just for clarity, the, the yellow, like County Road Fifty Two, that's Cooper's Falls. Uh, so it heads oh, into like, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that heads into Ramirez Township. Um and up through oh, 169. Yeah, so well yeah, yeah, 169 has a pretty decent quant quantity of traffic, like 8200, 8500 um well exceeds most of our roadways. And uh and so you can see those volumes are, are objectively higher than any other county road in the in the township. Um 16 being only five thousand. Um, 17 actually is quite low too, or in 1700 sure. maximum. Go ahead, never cross. Speaking of that, 169, how many lights? <laughs> Don't throw that in while we're driving by. <laughs> through the lights, through the chair. I, I would like to report that they're completed. <laughs> The contractor is on site this week, uh, has mobilized some equipment out to site there. So uh, we are hopeful uh, that, that that turn lane gets completed. We can activate the lights in the near future. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Derek. Okay, so cruising along, um, road classifications. Uh, this ended up being a pretty big part of the project um, because our previous road classification system was a little bit outdated and certainly um, didn't reflect the, the, the type of naming for the transportation um, geometric design guidelines that were produced, I believe, in 2018 or so. And so the consultant re rejigged all of the classifications into the more normal terms. Uh, so we got provincial freeway, byway, arterial, collector road, local road, private condominium, or laneway. Um, instead of the old system where we had a rural road, it would have a number which was associated to the uh, to the traffic volumes. So they did that, and, uh, and you can see here what the um, old classification used to look like. So, you know, code 100 through 800, LRs through arterials. And uh, map six and seven now show the new classifications. And so there's the new um, classifications, and some have been reclassed. Uh, you know, we wanted to look at truly what is an arterial road, and we don't have many. Um, arterial roads are typically like a county road connects provincial highway system to either large uh, urban settlement areas or another arterial road or another highway. Um, some good examples would be like, and this is a this seems to be the wrong map, but Division Road is 100% an arterial road. It, it connects <coughs> Highway 12 to uh, um, some other roads if we get closer to the uh, West Shore area, like our tree of drive, for instance, is a collector roadway. Um, it collects, you know, traffic from the, the highway uh, 11 transportation system back to a, another collector roadway, which is kind of considered at Minoki Beach Road once development is, uh, is in place. Okay, that's the classification project. Um, Parking, so we, we reviewed all of the parking that's available publicly in, in Severn, and uh, the consultant basically identified that we are a little deficient in parking, you know, in our two main downtown ports. Um, specifically, the cold water on the water road in and around the downtown is limited to parking, 55 spaces for that many is, is underserved, and, uh, and, and another one is Muskoka Street. You know, 38 park parallel on street parking for that area is underserved. Um, so that's just a, a recognizing that the that the parking supply is quite low. I'm not going to pass. Do the chair to Derek. Derek, um, Coldwater Road, are those numbers right? Because if we take out those other parking spots, and we're not going to have a barrier. Free 
So that would choose to be the change, I think? No? Yeah, through, through the CARE, I think the count would, would have been prior to that. Like, this is a two year project, and I think we just took out that about a year and a half ago. Yeah, I just um, don't know if we could be able to upgrade this to the current, or come back and do that when we look at it. Yeah, through the chair, I think because of the changing climate at all times, these are a little bit snapshot of time, especially yeah. as the data. So in the fifth year uh, review of this, that might change, and maybe for the better. You know, if we undertake a, a you know, parking improvement uh, somewhere, but um, I think 55 is probably before the removal of yeah, the change. Yeah. And the other one is Muskoka Street. <clears throat> and, and I'm bringing up something that probably isn't similarly parking, but when we get the new lights in, are you going to leave that pedestrian walkway there? It'll be gone, right? Because they'll cross at the lights. Yeah, through the chair. It's actually not permitted by uh, yeah, the design so. guidelines to have okay. the two that close together. So that would open up a couple of parking spots and maybe on Main Street. Perfect, right by the ice cream. Yeah. You are a member Jansen. Through the chair, um, on the, in the table 2.7 for municipal home parking lots, uh, there's a lot that's on Fire Hall Lane. Um, is that uh, municipal or not? I don't see it on the list uh, of um, uh, that's five and table 2.7. Certainly, yeah, through the chair. Um, we call it Joseph Street parking lot, but you're right, it's on Fire Hall Lane and it's uh, 38. And we had, we recently did some elimination in there as well yeah. um, to provide because it was later in the evening in the winter where staff were coming home in a, in a dark parking lot. So we uh, we did that project three or four years ago, uh, three years ago, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, through to Derek, it, this may not be it either, but we're talking about active transportation, we're talking about parking. Um, how do you get people to park in the areas that are not on the main street? And then they all say, Well, there's no parking, and you know, we have to do all this. There was a some seminar or webinar I went to, and I just wanted to let you know is what they did at the parking lot. It was they, they had these unique signs that said, count your steps. And so you you get 280 steps to walk to the down to the main street and back. So now you, you know, and, and they were to encourage people to kind of do that. So I, I don't know if it's something that we can look at, but it was an encouragement. I thought it was kind of neat because there are a lot of people who carry those phones and they've got their watches on and they're all counting steps. So I just was wondering. Through the chair, um, that you know, that's a great idea. And the purpose of this plan is to identify, like, never have we before said there's a parking challenge or inventory parking supply versus uh, what would be typical for an area. So this plan would identify that there is a problem, and then staff would, throughout the years, um, provide recommendations referring back to the master plan that says, you know, we have a parking challenge. Perhaps we implement something where it's a bit more. Uh, I like that idea. Count your steps from here to there. They can park in and around the arena, right? We know there's quite a bit of parking there, but people don't use it. Yeah, and supplemental, it, I find it amazing because people will park in a mall and want ages to get to the mall, but for some reason they think the community center is like miles from the main street of Coldwater and the same in the shade of. So I just thought there might be some little incentive. Right, there's just a question on that page. So the two on our Dickshire Road is at the Southern Falls and Tea Lake. Do the chair there. Uh, the um, MNR. MNR. They, they are in here. Yeah. They're, I believe the McLean Lake boat launch is different, but it's the easy ones here. Well, should you uh, identify them? Because that's kind of vague for the average person. But why not say Kevin Falls and Key Lake? For, for sure, yeah, we can change the name. Uh, just Upper Big Shoot North, uh, I believe, was uh, Key Lake, right? Yeah, and that's that upper big shoot that uh, I'm not sure where that is. Sorry, McLean Lake? Or not McLean Lake, sorry, Jim. There's another parking lot south of that location. It's not McLean Lake. Uh, it's in Seven Falls. We'll, we'll get an address. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, yeah, there's one in Seven Falls and one in Key Lake. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so moving right along, um, the next section talks about par parking supply restrictions. And, uh, you know, we do have a parking bylaw that we referenced in here, and that 
we do have a number of restrictions, including on-street restrictions. So although we may provide on-street parking in the summer, which is great, um, we do got to remember that one of our primary services is to provide winter control, and during all of December 1st to March 31st, it is restricted for our on-street parking. So, so that solution that isn't a year-round solution. Um, we talked about roadway surfaces and, and road discontinuities, and this section um, pre predominantly talks about the surface type. And unlike the um, surface type issue of condition of existing asphalt, it's talking about where you have a granular road surface that has a higher traffic volume or a function than should be for a gravel road surface. So a gravel road surface is great for those rural roadways with low traffic volumes, you know, typically serving farmland community, um, that kind of area. That that is the, the great solution. But when you get past you know 200 cars a day and a roadway function that might be more collector than than local, um, those are ideal candidates for upgrade specimens. So there's a map of all the different surface types. And then we talked about existing conditions and active transportation. So we do have um, a wonderful abandoned railway line that ended up being a uh, part of the Trans-Canada Trail Network, 30 kilometers of trail. And uh, it spans from one end of their township to the other at about a 45 degree bisection. Um, a wonderful asset that provides a ton of active tra tra transportation uh, opportunities for almost all of our seven towns. A little less than more than five, but uh, for sure throughout most, most of the year. Um, we talked about the existing sidewalk network. You know, there, there, therein lies the number, uh, 6.5 kilometers of sidewalk, or over 400 kilometers of road. Yeah. So you can see there that, like the, the uh, 2014 Transportation Master Plan, we still have a challenge with um, available sidewalk networks in our urban centers. Uh, transit facilities, so we don't currently have any of our own, but we do through the county. Um, so that's the Lynx program. And we also have Ontario Northland. So Ontario Northland provides sort of more regional travel, um, you know, Toronto Barry, North Bay, and Toronto Ferry Sound Sudbury. And uh, there is bus stations actually located both in Fort Severn and Fort Worth. Thank you. I like having the, the uh, Ontario Northland Transit Facilities with the transit facilities listed. From the conference we went to, hosted by the County of Simcoe recently, I attended the presentation on transportation. And one thing that um, you might want to consider at adding is there is a links to home service that is accessible transit uh, for someone, for whatever reason, that isn't able to navigate a public uh, bus, they can um, go on a links accessible. It's uh, a nominal charge. I think it's still two dollars a ride, and they can take a caregiver or someone with them. So uh, it's um, it's an additional and separate um, arm of links. But I think it, it would be good information to include if you if you wanted to. Perfect. Yeah, no, I, I did make a note to add the links to home. Um, that is a great service. I actually wasn't aware of it at the time, but more recently I became aware of it. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so, going through the rest, we there's a one well, thing I have never continental we'll talk to you here. Jared, when we're doing the um, County of Sinclair Institute, I think we should say that there is a stop in Gold Water, just so people know. Because if, if, if they do, and we, we, I mean, we know we have to change it, but there is a bus stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, then. Uh, back to you, Gary. So the next few maps, they do show the sidewalk locations. Um, so there's been in West Shore, um, quite a bit more in Coldwater, and uh, just the tiniest little bit in Marchmont community. And Washago is just the main main drag there, um, but on the Scopus Street. Okay, and then this map shows the various uh, regional type and transit systems. So we got CP, the Rail, Lynx, and Ontario Northland. And uh, once again, this shows how we looked beyond just Severn on how the Severn integrates with the province in a, in a transportation type fashion. 
So emerging technologies, we asked the consultant to give us some advice um, and at least identify what, what could be some changes coming down um, you know, through technology. We know that there are electrifications, there are um, like conversion to electric vehicles. Um, there's also a role in AI where uh, you know, there is some potential for vehicles to drive themselves. And uh, you know, that in itself would change the road authority's approach to um, transportation design, management, and stuff like that. So in here, we talked about some emerging technologies and uh, have identified where we currently have some electric plug-in locations. Um, there's one on Brody Drive, uh, County Road 169, um, even one at Kelly's Road there in Fort Severn at Raleigh, and uh, Long Pine Road, which is actually on the other side, Jordan Bay, but it's nearby uh, for some of these charging locations. I've never finished. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious. Are these um, are these paid for by the township? These charging locations? No. And then the cost to charge. I'm not familiar with it. Then the the money or the doesn't go back to the township at all. It's just here to tell us where the locations are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, through the chair. So, um, like part of the transportation master plan isn't to only look at the services that Severn provides, but how transportation as as a whole is delivered in Severn. So whether it be private entity like Link, uh, Links is technically the county, but um, Ontario Normland, right? And so this is another privatized uh, service. Um, there is a fee, you know, to use a lot of these um, charging stations to to use. It's a private venture. But um, some municipalities are offering these services at their community centers or here like at this administration office for a set fee. So we, we could be a player in that service. Uh, we're not yet. But I think the idea that this section just identifies that that's a coming change. Um, and then we can use this section later if, we, if there is a grant, uh, you know, for some charging stations at a, at a local facility, um, you know, public, public facility, that sort of thing, um, to become a, a player in that service. Thank you, I'm Amber Cox. Yeah, <clears> through <throat> the chair to Gary. I had talked to um, Jill at the SSEA because of the FCO grants, but there aren't any more. But they have, since then, the SSEA has hired a climate control person or uh, something. Anyway, she was saying that through, he's looking for private uh, grants and loans, and then if there does anything come up, she'll let you know. So I said, I just thought maybe it says um, opportunity exists that maybe we should put in the SSEA because they look after our climate action plan, and they said that they would indicate to us, or if he found three ones that he would let us all know, and, and we are with them. So it, it is an opportunity for us that we don't have on our own. Perfect. Yeah, I've added a note there to uh, reach out. Thank you. I'm Amber Minnings. Sorry, I want to find a question in this section. In the maps, it does show railway, and I know that there is a railway stop, I believe, in Washago that is for passengers too, although I've never used it. Um, but I don't see it listed in 2.9 as a transportation facility. Is it considered one or not? I'm just curious. Through the chair, it certainly is. And anytime, and and not even just passengers, but goods is a transportation service, right? So um, the CN Railway operates both CN uh, cargo and Via runs a rail for a rail service that's for passengers. So you'll see that on the map here, where it says Via Rail on the CN corridor and the CP line, which is uh, predominantly cargo. Um, we've identified all of those connections and what kind of service we have in Severn. Um, unfortunately, if we did this plan, you know, maybe uh, 80 years ago, uh, you would have a lot more. Uh, rail was quite a predominant feature in the province, and you know, now we're down to CP and CM uh, as our two rail operations. Okay, so moving along, if I can, um, emergency detour routes were discussed in this plan, and of course, the emergency detour route is then. A provincial highway system might have a failure, um, a full closure, if you will, will. That traffic is like water. It doesn't really stop. It just goes somewhere else. And so that can impact your local road network uh, quite a lot. And so they reviewed the EDR system that was published by the Ministry of Transportation. And we noted that there was very little EDRs in Severn, uh, actually none. 
And the only one that provides some bypass through Highway 11 is through the city of Aurelia, through Lackley, and Commerce Drive, and so on. And so the consultant looked for opportunities to provide that. There are limited opportunities in our existing network to fully provide uh, what would be considered an EDR. Um, actually, only one, and that's on Agnew Road. So if there was a failure on Agnew Road between basically Shoreview um, and uh, Sister Lake Road, there are two overpasses that could be connected via Agnew. So that's the one recommendation. We did explore some on the Highway 400 series highway, which is uh, the failure um, between Horry Road and um, uh, County Road 16, I think it is. And so a failure in that event would create a bypass along like that Bay Road uh, on um, A side. But that's all. That's a bit of a challenge as well. So they will naturally go through Horry Road and uh, through most of the County Road system uh, into cold water. But we haven't recommended that. It's quite a long duration of detour. Um, and it's quite impactful going straight through the center of cold water. Or have ever Jared, the Eco Side Road, they, they dump on that one a lot because there seems to be accidents there because we had those complaints from the people on the Stockdale and, and the fact that the trucks were all meandering around in through there. So I, did, I don't think you want to say it's one, but I, I do know that we did have some issues there for a few times with accidents. Yeah, through the chair, I, I think. You know, um, there will be an accident on a highway and they will, they will have traffic go pretty much anywhere. Um, so that's an inevitable. Where you find you can establish a road structure and the on and off points that are um, ideal for that, then you can post signage along there and really direct it along those routes. If you don't have any of those features, it's not really an EDR um, and, and kind of have that random scatter. It's, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. The Chair. Isn't Council's responsibility to ensure that there are emergency evacuation routes um, posted? I was actually in a, in a situation on Highway 11 and made the unfortunate mistake of turning um, east on Goldstein, whereas if I went, would have gone west out further to one of the cleaner roads, uh, more rural, and across I would have been able to come back to where I needed to go, um, but without having signs posted. So I'm just curious what our role and responsibility is and liability, et cetera. Et cetera. Through the chair, um, from the MTO, and this is published um, stance on, on EDRs, it's, it's fully the municipal's responsibility to create an EDR if they wish. So the idea there is if, if we want to um, provide an alternative detour route, we can. We have to make sure that it meets geometric design guidelines and can support that type of direct loading and sign. We provide the signs and everything like that. They'll add it to their map. Um, the MTO is not offering much in terms of helping with that process, um, but they'll certainly accept us doing that. The alternative is, you know, you end up having a longer stop. If a traffic accident on the highway happens without an EDR, the the traffic flow will, will stop, and if they'll find any opportunity to do, they'll go everywhere like a scattered approach. But most likely, just stay there right on the highway and leave. Um, you know, so it's a it's, it's a negative benefit, but I don't know if we want to start signing EDRs through Bayou and through Cumberland Road and through. Cold water and through areas that really aren't designed for that kind of loading, because that's exactly where the whole brunt of the entire network is going to go in the event, and the MTO will know that, so they'll close it even earlier up to the next reasonable intersection that your EDR supports to direct 100% of that traffic volume through those areas. Okay, so moving along into um, the truck traffic area. So this is where we talked about, you know, what is what is Severn's role in aggregate um, resource and how does it impact the transportation network? We make some notes in here that we are one of the largest aggregate producers in Ontario, and as such, we have one of the largest truck traffics uh, in in our area on certain roads for sure. And then in here, we also talk about the need for, and I want to emphasize this, is equally as important is having a plan in place that minimizes volume of truck traffic through key corridors that serve residential, recreational, tourism, 
and commercial activities. And effectively, we want to separate heavy truck traffic from all other forms of traffic. So there, there lies the statement, uh, I would say the problem statement relating to aggregate truck traffic inside. Uh, I think the mayor had asked about where the different quarries were, and you've got a chart showing some of them here, and there's some that are on them. So, yeah, we can cruise along um, into table 2.8, which is pits and quarries. But yes, not all are listed here. Um, there are a few that either are pits that um, you know have been inactive for a while and sort of that, that sort of thing, but this covers most of them. So, Lafarge, um, up on Quarry Road. Um, quite, quite an extraction limit at 1.8 million tons per year. Nelson's a major player in this game at uh, four and a half million tons per year. And uh, and then you got some others here like Mac, Broccoli, and Walkers. Walkers with three million up on the coastline. So those are the major ones. Um, the pits, we actually own two of them. Um, you'll see here that we're even missing one of them. So we have a pit on Carlion Line and we have a pit on Anderson Line. We didn't report on the, the the pit on Anderson line, we're not actively using that. Uh, Ever for Ken has a comment. Here's the charity there. I see that we have seven aggregates limited, but how did we arrive at 500,000 tons a year when having made an application? I'm just curious. Uh, through the chair, I believe that was through correspondence um, uh, from seven aggregates mm -hmm. as an estimate. Uh, never cost. Yeah, through to Derek. Derek, do you know how much we own? On Anderson, yeah, but like a, a like just the round thing you have up there. Uh, yeah. So through the chair, the Anderson property is not physically owned by us. It's through a license agreement. That's with what Kevin I thought. Simcoe. Okay. And um, I I can't recall. It was 30, 30 or forty acres. Yeah. And it was uh, uh, the extraction limits are no nowhere near completed, but the quality of the aggregates kind of been diminished. Yeah. Um, and uh, we just currently aren't. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so so that's the aggregate, um, and then of course the map. Uh, this map is useful in seeing where you know, potential aggregate sources and sites might be. Um, this is a geotechnical map from the, the province, actually, where um, there's been some uh, provincial-wide scale mapping of aggregate. Uh, and it, it, it ties in nicely with the existing aggregate locations that are, that are currently in place. Um, so existing traffic operations, so you'll see here in this section that we, we looked at uh, turning movement count, so they physically produced uh, 22 intersection and 15 minute block uh, counts in the summer of uh, 2017. That was actually from the Rosemead study, and we enhanced that with this process uh, doing the 10 intersection counts um, noted there in the movements. So that gave us a good idea of what kind of traffic volumes we see in the township. Um, we talked about a few uh, intersection operations that are, are doing well and a few that are not doing so well. So you'll, you'll see here in the table, um, level of service A is good and F feels bad. And, uh, and it's really down to how many seconds per vehicle the lane is. Kind of effectively what the uh so uh, the there's back. back up a little bit there were uh, upper big shoot row at the for say uh four way corner that's come up a few times there over town line and uh Mount Stephen. But what's well, we just have two roads going on to a county road so how do how do we uh hook up with the county it's the same thing at Irish line and upper big shoot road so what do you bigger signs or flashing sign or uh, through the chair, not necessarily. It, this is just um, identifying traffic patterns. So when you do a count in an intersection, you know all of a sudden three or four legs of traffic information. So you know how many went down on Stephen, you know how many went down, down line, and you know the direction of travel for Upper Big Shear Road. That's what we were more interested in. It wasn't about the safety. We didn't do a safety audit on the intersection. We physically just counted how many cars went in each direction. Because just uh, from intro there, the, the, you're going south of Arbor Big Road and, and go straight through to town line. 
and another car is coming from Old Water, and who has it's an unclear who has right, but I presume who's ever on up would be sure who has the upper as they right away, but it's it's a it's a gray area there and potential for a, an accident for sure. Member Minions. Thank you for the chair. On this list, Bayou at Grand Hammer at Crescent the last bullet, that will absolutely give a traffic count of cars coming up mainly from the Bayou Park subdivision, perhaps from the Tim Hortons. But the other area that meets the definition of a two-way stop and hold intersection is actually Bayou at Cumberland Road, where if you were to do a traffic count there, you would also capture the number of vehicles that go past the elementary school and that come up north on the highway and then just have to go directly onto the overpass to go south. So they're just using it as a feeder. And the area of Bayou and Cumberland Road um, is much busier, I would I would assume, and I would like to see that number captured also. Through the, through the chair, um, so we certainly didn't do all intersections. Uh, we did pick this one because Grand Tamarack has had quite an impact following this importance um, relocation, I guess you would call it. And so we wanted to capture some new data there because we had some existing data that we could compare. That's why we chose that intersection. Um, it is a recommendation of this plan to do continued monitoring of the traffic volumes on all of Severn's roadway. And uh, it would be of interest for sure during the design phase of the Bay Road to capture another town further up closer to the highway. Okay, so that's um, a little bit of description of what a uh, traffic intersection count can do. Um, morning peak hour, afternoon peak hour just means when was it busiest in the morning, when was it busiest at night, and how long did you have to wait? And so there's some tables, it gives you an idea that, to, to be fair, most of our intersections are operating quite well. Um, level of service A's, B's, uh, those are excellent wait times, um, low volume effectively. And uh, some of our busier ones for sure, you know, uh, Wayman Line and Division Road is a busy intersection, uh, but it's a it's a level of service A and B because it, you don't really have to wait that long in the grand scheme of things. One that comes up is Burnside Line and Division Road. Division Division Road is uh, a very competing roadway in in that intersection. It's not a secondary road per se. It's like two primary roads hit each other, and the primary traffic truck traffic coming down Burnside results, which is the through road at the time. Uh, results in a long delay on division road. So this is one where the consultant said, of all of your intersections in the township, if you're going to invest some money, that would be the one. And they were talks. Good chair, chair. I'm not sure if this is the place to talk about it. But there is somewhere in here that it talks about the eventuality of division road going back to the county. Have we do we know any, or are we still in that? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, and I'll speak to it because uh, I don't know if you were here, Derek, but the county was willing before we resurfaced Division oh, yeah. Road, they were looking at taking the road, and this is their words verbatim. They said, We'd be happy to take it over. You expropriate all the land because the county road is a higher standard of road. So you'll have to expropriate land to, to meet the conditions of a county road, build a road, pave the road at a cost of about $30 million, and then I'd be happy to take it over. So we won't even go down that path. No, no, but there is. He's got that path. He's got it down there because they, that's, and that is not fair because they took that uh, old Fort Road and they took Mount St. Louis Road and they're all worse than our division road and they took those because a county road is supposed to join two main highways and they take Horseshoe Valley and then they stop and they should have right through because that goes to Highway 11. Uh, sorry. No, 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 Derek, speak through, through the chair. So um, I think it's useful to still put in your transportation yeah. after plan that that is a transportation uh, challenge 
You know, we have a right now a municipal, a lower level, a lower tier municipal roadway that acts like a regional roadway. Mm -hmm. So that's a transportation related concern. We should identify it here, and we also make reference to the county's transportation master plan that, save and accept any real conversation on cost, that is a regional roadway. It acts like it, it operates like it, and um, they know it, we know it. So let's continue to write it down because, I mean, that's not going away. No. Okay. And, yeah. Carry on then, Eric. Okay, so then uh, through uh, yeah, sorry, through the chair, um, we got a little map that showed where we did our uh, turning movement counts, and uh, you know we could have done a lot more intersections. We we're kind of on a budget, and we picked the ones that we thought would give us the best reference representation for the streamline analysis, and also uh, where we felt that there might be um, a poor level of service, like Division Road there. So. And that brings me to the next part, which is the screen line analysis. So um, the consultant does a model of our transportation network and says, where are people coming from? Where are they going and how do they get there? And so uh, the screen line says, you know, they're generally going north, south travel on Upper Big Shoot, and you know, there's one corridor of transportation. It's better seen in a map. Um, there should be a map right here. So in here is the screen line analysis thing, you know, your um, one screen line is kind of parallel with Fox Mead, north and south between wards one and two, give or take. Um, you know, there's obviously a screen line analysis uh, heading up the Highway 11 series, um, highway in, in uh, West Shore, and it's, it's actually generally heading north from Muskoka, whether it be through South Sparrow Lake Road or through the Highway 11 corridor, what have you. So that's how they do their analysis, and then that supports how they correct and update the overall estimated traffic count and volume on each road segment. Kind of a long-winded way of saying we updated the traffic counts. <clears throat> um, collision, and is there any questions on the screen line? Um, collision analysis. So collision analysis, we looked at data from a five-year trend. Um, they're produced by the MTO. So anytime you get to a collision and it's reported, um, it goes onto the map. And so we did some analysis of that. We did find that um, in the intersection counts, rather, that Division Road West, uh, two-way stop control of Burnside, is one of our higher number of collisions overall, including fatality. And uh, actually, sorry, that was Division Road West at Utah. There was only the one fatality um, in that five-year period in those two intersections. Go ahead, Number Um The Utah Division Road one, I happen to be coming from uh, Waller, and I talked to Member Brennan yesterday, and I don't know if it's my car because I'm low, but I didn't, the stop sign is, it's covered until I got to that farm post. I don't know if it's the way the trees are or I sit low, but that's that whole intersection is kind of in. I just, it just dawned on me and I saw it and I thought I mentioned that. They, they, somebody should check that. Certainly. And during our annual sign review, we note vegetation and take vegetation out. Yeah. Um, and so hopefully that's not a concern at the moment, but um, these are these are more old school dot level. Where are we having collisions and what should we do about it? Yeah. And so that's where the recommendations to provide. And signals. that's that's a deadly one. Right. We give a lot of that to yeah. For sure. Um, so, um, Member Burkett. Not to, so through the chair, not to pick on the quarries again, but again, the quarries are costing us makers. A million dollars, I think it's 900,000 to put a set of lights at that intersection, mm -hmm. and, and the quarries are not going to pay for it. You know, I don't want anyone to get hurt, so we will have to look at that. In the future, but. okay. So moving, um, that's uh, a long bit of description of collision and what we saw in the text here, uh, including uh, areas of deer and moose. Um, so you know, we we looked at the statistics and we were somewhat surprised by wildlife collision. Uh, so you know, we do have a few signs that say deer crossing, moose crossing, that sort of thing, but they're in the right spots because we certainly do see those collision numbers in Severn. Um, in this area here is the highlighted area of collision um, more than any other spot in Severn in terms of its length. This I think just your work with the other names. Thank you, through the chair. Yeah, it is my word, but it concerns 
mostly people, and I think that don't live that pass through. So my question is around, I understand that I was 11, as you mentioned earlier, is the MTO jurisdiction. But my question is, what can the township and council do about the 11 feeder streets that uh, feed on and off that highway as part of our transportation master plan? So through the chair, our recommendation is to push for the MTO during a widening process to the six lanes to consider going far west or north, what this direction. That, that's our recommendation. Um, the, the current connection points, I mean, if you were to correct that with a service road, you'd have to buy a lot of homes and you would have to create a lot of disruption. <laughs> Yeah, supplemental, and I wasn't thinking of taking, uh, of doing that. I was just thinking of uh, preventing access to the highway from the end of those roads and leaving everything else status quo until MTO uh, makes that change. And again, it's just a, a thought whether or not that's been considered because I don't know with any certainty whether or not having feeder roads has caused this number of accidents in this one area just looking at it i would have to assume that there's something different happening in this very small stretch that um, is creating all the, of these accidents so, so through the chair we we can um we'll, we'll continue to have that conversation like this is identifying the problem um i think if i hear like removing the connections from the highway creates a whole other transportation challenge, which is fragmentation of the network, um, basically little dead end streets everywhere. And uh, you know, that also doesn't, that's not a principle under transportation design. If you try to make things connected and you try to make things so that there's multiple points of in and out access, um, that would be like uh, sort of creating a new problem. Um, so if I can move on a little bit from that, um, this map is only the what we call a heat map of the collision statistics that we uh, that we obtained from the MTO, and you can see it. It makes sense to where we have traffic. You know, in the areas where we have pretty much no traffic, um, the rural setting, rural rural roadways, um, there's very little traffic or collisions. But then in and around Coldwater, in and around the 400 series highway, definitely along the 11 series corridor. Um, is where we get our collision statistics. And then in the area that's fully our jurisdiction is Burnside, Division Road, um, and even Burnside, or Division Road and Wayne. So those are the, the kind of highlight areas where we're finding collision statistics. Okay, Member Burkett. Thank you for the chair to member many comments, but I think one needs to realize that the majority of these accidents that are happening along this corridor is the ward. Are probably people from out of town. It's, it's not the locals, and, and it isn't. This has been ongoing for years. And I can imagine when the barrier wasn't there, there was never a barrier. And I witnessed accident that, and especially on a Friday night or on a Sunday when they're trying to head home. So I think it's great to have it in the document, but it's going to be MTO driven. So that's the only way. That, and I'm not sure what their solution will be, but uh, we can't dictate how these drivers. Drive and, and there's almost two or three times during the summer an accident at uh, right across from Tim Hortons. It's the name of that road you mentioned it. Uh, so thank you, Eagle. For whatever reason, they keep hitting that hydro pole. Yeah. I have no idea why. Distracted driver. Okay, good. I think, Gary, we can wrap it up here and we'll stop the day. I think it was excellent getting all the committee up to speed and, and good input. And uh, I'm looking at my calendar. I just wondered if Wednesday, August the 16th, would work. I'm looking over at the CAO, but that's for how do you wish to proceed? Um, thank you. I guess my first question through the chair is Are we at a place where we just have a little tidying to do and we can do it attached to a corporate services, or do you need a special meeting? Because I know for our members that work, extra meetings are a challenge. So, um, 
I would take your direction on that. I, I, I feel like we got through the major points and there's only a little tidying left. And if Derek does the tidying between now and August corporate services, that might be enough time. Yeah, but you sure tell me. Yeah, our corporate services is the 23rd and I didn't know whether we needed a full day on the, the week before, but I let the committee speak. I never asked. Well, August 16th, Larry. No, it's not. No? We don't have one. No planning in August? August 23rd <clears throat> is the AMO conference. I'm not sure yet if Amos uh, from the 20th to the 22nd, think whether we come home on the Wednesday morning. I'm not sure. I think we have Happy to the chair to Madam CEO's comments. Like one of the one of the important services meetings is not heavy. Yeah. And if we can spend a couple more hours on this, yeah, we done. And be done with it. Yeah. That's okay with council. I'll let Andrew speak, but but um, yeah. I guess the question came up that our meeting on the twenty third is that still happening, or are we? But Andrew's got his hand up. So if Lori's on, sorry. If I can, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Uh, the corporate services meeting is scheduled for the 30th of August. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And no planning in August. Okay. Uh, Madam CEO. Oh, I was just going to say, unless we need one, right? You're, you're on the summer break until after an AMO. If we need a meeting, then we'll call one, but uh, trying to give you a bit of a break. Is that what you, you wish there? It's, it's Joey. We, uh, we can always decide from here until we can always change it. Can we not, Madam CEO? Just whoever. Or Mr. Blunkett. If I can, through the uh, chair, uh, I was just going to suggest and further that the revised, this would have been the motion, that the revised transportation master plan be deferred to a future meeting for further discussion. So. You could actually select the date yeah. um, afterwards. So it's um, like we do have a council meeting on the ninth, so perhaps we could finalize it. And there you can quick break. Right. Uh, I, yeah, I've never talks and never makes. I'd like to put it to the two members who work full time to see what's good for them. I, I think yeah, Member Jansen had his hand up earlier and then uh, never made. <clears throat> for, for myself, uh, I think it, it would be. Um, uh, helpful if uh, the dates were sent out in advance for consideration. Just so I can uh, properly look at my schedule to ensure that that uh, works. You have remains and then other talks. Yes, and for my schedule, I routinely uh, take vacation days from my full time job on Wednesdays uh, to accommodate meetings. So a Wednesday in the summer would still work for me. But so what about the ninth? It's the council meeting. It probably won't be a heavy one. Do you want to try the ninth, and it will be like a morning meeting? Yes. So okay, what? So what month are we talking about? August. August. Lost. Do we have a scheduled council I think meeting? We didn't have one for the ninth. Scheduled yeah. council meeting. Council meeting. So, uh, Derek is on vacation, so okay, he's he's key to key to this. So I, I guess I I didn't I didn't hear a definitive answer to my question. I I think you only have a little bit more work to do, so I think you could cover it in August corporate services okay, that's perfect. already booked. So now and we're doing corporate services in person, so yeah. it makes 30. an in-person discussion. So I'm suggesting August we bring it back August thirtieth. You did the idea. I'll be on vacation now. Okay. <clears throat> the chamber of council meeting? I like that one. <laughs> um, which is fine, but then you'll have to decide if you want to come in or not because council is on. Person. We can do it in person. On the ninth? Or the sixth, I mean. Are you okay for that, Dan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the Wednesday. That's yeah. the Wednesday, right? Yeah. Derek, yeah. you're okay on, on the Say September? Yeah, yeah, September the second. That would be better. Okay. Then you got to advance notice. Perfect. Okay. If I can then uh, go. Let me see one more. 
Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you because it's not just us wondering or saying we don't like something. This has been very educational for all of us, and I think going through it so everybody understands where what, what this is about is a really good thing. So I just want to thank you again for putting up with us, wanting to make sure we, <laughs> we get to know everything together and, and go through it because everyone's sort of a lot of us have the same questions and areas. So that's thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Jared. Well done. Well, yes. Okay, we have a motion uh, This mic is on the mic. There we go. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, uh, the motion would read in further that the revised transportation plan. Oh, sorry. The motion is actually that public works report number W23 020, dated June 14th, 2023, with respect to the transportation master plan, be received. And further, that the revised transportation plan be deferred to the September 6th, 2023 meeting of council for further discussion. Any discussion? Yeah, we have a mover list, please. Moved by member Brennan, second by member Jansen. All in favor? That's carried. And we have a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that this meeting be and is hereby now adjourned. Mover moved by Member McIntyre, second member of meetings, all in favor. Harry, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.